can admiration and disgust coexist? That will be a question on my mind as I discuss with my guest, Him to Shanghai by Lin Yutang. So Him to Shanghai is a hymn to the old Shanghai, and my guest is a guy who is, you know, somewhat impressed with the old Shanghai. It's Paul French, author of City of Devils, A Shanghai Noir, and lots of other amazing books about old Shanghai and old China. So he's the guy I'll be interviewing, and Lin Yutang's the author we're going to be talking about. First, a really quick piece of promo for the show's uh, Patreon. So I've got a new episode coming out today. It's coming out one half of an hour after I'll be done recording this intro. And by the time I've uploaded this episode, it'll already be out. And that's an episode on Han Han's 1988, I Want to Talk with the World. And I really enjoyed reading it. And the Patreon episode is just me for a significantly long amount of time just waffling on and on about it. So if, if you like the kind of more solo, um, yeah, if you like the solo episodes I do, and if, if you just enjoy hearing my thoughts on the translated Chinese books I've read, uh, the Patreon is for you, because that's basically what it is. Um, there's another episode lined up for next week that's a similar just kind of train of thought, uh, impressions upon reading a book. And the book I'll be talking about is uh, Last Quarter of the Moon by Chu Zijian, although I should say both of these books are ones I'm planning to do um, normal episodes on, but um, the Patreon I'm kind of kind of formulating my thoughts in advance, so that's there if, if you're interested and would like to help out the show. Of course there's hours and hours of other um, stuff up there too, there's a whole uh, special interview episode I did with the translator Dylan Levi King, and there's quite a few different Chinese sci-fi episodes there too. But yeah, enough enough uh, promo, enough of me trying to lure you into paying me some money <laughs> via Patreon, let's get on to the Churchill fake news. So our first news item... It is about Chinese sci-fi, I just can't stop talking about it, can I? So uh, a friend of the show, Yen Ui, she got a little article up in the Science Fiction Research, Research Association's uh, website. It's kind of like an open access article for you guys to read. It's called Chinese Science Fiction, A Genre of Adversity. And she basically talks, talks about some of the kind of forces or barriers that Chinese science fiction has come up with um, in, in original Chinese in China and in translation. It's an interesting read. It's not too long and it's not too short. And Yen is, you know, an awesome individual. And it's an interesting one for me because one of the sources cited here is um, the discussions that were had at that genre fiction conference I went to way back in uh, October of last year, which Feels like a lifetime ago, but uh, <laughs> that's neither here nor there. So there's uh, lots of different Chinese sci-fi authors discussed in that article. Um, Han Song, Liu Cixin, Chen Fan, Xia Jia, I believe. Loads of interesting stuff. So if Chinese sci-fi is your bag and you like reading second order things about it, go check out Yen's article. Now the second news item, if you like Chinese sci-fi, well, you probably already know this and you um, you don't need the news update but I'm going to inject some of my own opinions and predictions. So this one is about three-body problem. You, you probably already heard. Um, it looks like a visual adaptation of three-body is finally going ahead. And after changing hands, I think, from Chinese film studios to Amazon, it's ended up in the hands of Netflix. And it looks like they've got writers too. It's the so-called D&D from Game of Thrones, David Benioff and D.B. Vice. So my... Suppose if you read it online, it's hard to um, not see someone expressing kind of worries that they're going to blow it like some people feel they blew Game of Thrones. The kind of mitigating factor is Leo Sashin, the author, has given his approval, and Ken Leo and I think Leo Sashin are going to be on board as like advisors or, or, or something. So that, that um, could be a really great thing production. It could be an amazing adaptation. It could be quite different from the books. Uh, who knows? My, my prediction here about something we might see is <laughs> drama. I saw someone with a tweet that was um, going going viral, getting retweeted a lot. Some guy thought he would at Leo Tsushin's Twitter account and challenge him as to why he um, seemed to endorse what's going on in Xinjiang 
the mass internment camps for the Uyghur and Muslim populations. And he'd kind of said in a passing remark that he thinks that's all right within China. And I, I think as, as we see more kind of these productions that link Chinese media and culture, and by Chinese, I mean like PRC from the People's Republic of China with the uh, Western or English speaking world. I think we're going to see more stuff like this. We're seeing it with um, the Disney Mulan film too. Um, I think it's, it's just an interesting thing because if if you'd been following Liu Cixin, you would have known that he's had, you know, this is what he believes. This is nothing new. But I think a whole new uh, range of people in these Western audiences are, I think there's going to be a gradual realization that, you know, people, people in the uh, Chinese literary or media world might have beliefs that you as a Western consumer find disturbing. And I, I'm, for, for better or for worse, I think we're going to see more of these um, challenges and interactions and questioning. If, if there's one thing I hope, it's that Liu Cixin won't get himself into trouble inside China. But yeah, I've I've already injected enough of my opinions, so let's go on to the last piece of uh, Church of Fig News. This one's nothing to do with sci-fi and nothing to do with politics, pretty much. Uh, actually, no, it, I think the, the book itself does, but I have... I've, I have nothing spicy to say about this, and it's not about the present. Um, this is a book I just found by looking for some, basically going on Twitter and looking for something to put in this new slot, and I saw a, a little tweet thread from Nick Admason, who seems to, I seem to be consistently uh, finding things to talk about from his tweets. Um, must be kindred spirits in some ways. But um, during the sc hashtag scholar strike that's been going on, he decided to fill the time with some uh, reading. And the book he picked up, it's only from two years ago. It's called Reading Lu Chun Through Carl Jung. And it's basically taking Carl Jungian therapeutic lens to Lu Chun's writings. And at first I thought, oh, that seems like a really random mishmash. But... Um, I read some info about the book, I read Nick's kind of uh, tweets about it, and it seems to actually be something of a match made in heaven. So, I mean, I love Lu Chun, I love Carl Jung, I'm gonna get this book. So this isn't news per se, this is a book that came out two whole years ago, but um, I don't care. It's my, it's my damn podcast, and if I want to do two-year-old news, I will. So yeah, uh, that's the end of our news segment for this episode. Let's go on and hear uh, what Paul French has to say about Lin Yutang. So we've got on the show Paul French. Paul, it is fantastic to have you on. How's it going over at your end? Not bad. Uh, yeah, I've managed to keep busy throughout lockdown, so I can't complain too much. Yeah, likewise, I suppose. For listeners who are not familiar with you, can you tell us a wee bit about yourself and what you do? Ooh, okay. Well, I've been quite fortunate in life in that uh, when I was 18, which is quite a long time ago now, I sort of uh, took up East Asian studies and Chinese history and of course Chinese language and um, then ended up spending ooh, nigh on 20 years in Shanghai, living always in Shanghai, but of course traveling a lot to Beijing and Hong Kong and, and around China. So I spent a lot of time in both Beijing and Shanghai uh, throughout the 90s and early 2000s and then eventually for various reasons, I left China in 2013 uh, and came back to the UK, though I, I revisit China well, until this year, usually twice a year. Mm. Um, so I guess, uh, I mean, I was working for a long time, uh, running a market research publishing company in Shanghai, which was kind of fun. And oh. then someone came along, which was even more fun, and bought it which freed me up around the same time as a book that I'd written. I'd written several books before, but a, a book that I'd written called Midnight in Peking actually kind of did very well. I was very fortunate and people really liked it. It got a few awards and was a New York Times bestseller. And that was all quite amazing. And that happened at a time when um, uh, I, I was being freed from the daily shackles of going to the office. And so I kind of have managed since then to, um, to be kind of a professional uh, I don't know, historian, raconteur, writer on China. And I've, I've written a lot more. And then eventually the book I really wanted to do, which was the old Shanghai book I did, which was a book called City of Devils. Mm. That was uh, that was really about all the foreign gangsters largely in in Shanghai between in the 1930s and, and through to the Second World War. Right. Um, and that, again, did quite well. So I've been very lucky. 
Um, I have to ask you before we go on to the next section. When you were living in Shanghai, uh, what districts or districts were you living in? Um, I lived most of my time in. Uh, so now, now, of course, I tend to, and I always do think think of Shanghai in the old ways because it's sort of mm. how I, I'm working on all the time. I lived in what would have been the old external Western roads out at um, uh, Xinhua Lu and Dingxi Lu, uh, which now, when I go back, is quite sort of um, jazzed up. Uh, Yu Yuan Lu mm-hmm. and around Zhongshan Park is all very jazzed up. It, it wasn't then, it was reasonably basic. And we used to be able to walk around. If you go along Xinhua Lu, there's the beautiful houses around Columbia Circle. And then up at the top there is J.G. Ballard's old house and so on. And I used to spend a lot of time around there. And there weren't so many, well, there weren't so many foreigners in Shanghai in the 1990s. And there certainly weren't so many people living there. And then the last few years that I lived in Shanghai, I had this kind of crazy belief that as the uh, subway grew and grew, um, foreigners would go and live in all sorts of areas that they hadn't lived in before, sort of north of Suzhou Creek, basically, which has sort of historically been terra, terra incognita for, <laughs> for, for, for foreigners. Uh, that didn't happen, actually. They seemed to all more concentrate in, um, in areas of the, of the French concession, like about three streets, really. Mm. So I thought that was a bit boring. And um, I... I got a uh, place over in what was the former sort of Jewish ghetto because I wanted to do a lot of research over there and uh, lived there for a couple of years and again around around Dalian Lu and and again that was um, you know reasonably um, not not remote but I mean it was off the sort of um, Lao Wai grid at that time yeah. um, but it was very interesting to be able to explore a lot of that area really you know building by building around the former Jewish ghetto and Tilan Chow and when the prison was still operating there. And of course, since then, as all across Shanghai, bits and pieces of Hong Kong, Tilan Chao, Yangpu particularly have been kind of smashed. Mm. But, um, so it was, it was a good time to kind of um, grab the last few years of that as an intact uh, district, which it's not now. So it was kind of um, interesting living over there. And, and of course, you know, what do I know? My prediction that everyone would live everywhere because the subway would allow you to move around easily just didn't happen. There were lots of places north of Suzhou Creek that I think are really interesting. And I write about that area a lot, the former Little Tokyo and, and, and out to kind of uh, the Jewish ghetto area and so on. So I'm always kind of, um, you know, advocating for it. Yeah, I have a few happy memories exploring up there. Um, when you said the Lawa grid, I immediately knew what you meant. Um, as, as fun as the Lawa grid was when I was living there, it was very easy to um, escape it. it. You know, it just took the slightest hop over the one inch barrier into some you know, the unfamiliar streets. Um, Speaking of unfamiliar streets, let's hop in our podcast time machine and head back into jazz age, art deco age, Shanghai. Um, Yeah, so before I ask you anything about the author or the story we've picked for this this episode, I think it would be fun to just do some old Shanghai focused questions since you are Paul French, the old Shanghai city of devils guy. So old Shanghai has come up on the show, the show a few times. And maybe most prominently when I did uh, Alien Chang's uh, Lost Caution, did that quite early on, um, an early episode. And then more recently, I had an episode on the Book of Shanghai from Comma Press, which was lots of translated short stories that are all about Shanghai, but they're all about very, well, a lot of them are in modern Shanghai, to be fair. But generally speaking, they're all about very different versions of Shanghai, be it in like uh, time, place, class, or genre. So if, there, if there's anything I've learned about Shanghai is that it's very multi-dimensional sort of place. Um, I mean, I already knew that, but the podcast has really emphasized that for me. So in our, our uh, story or maybe our, our piece or our poem or whatever we're calling it for this episode, um, Him to Shanghai, the version or the dimension of Shanghai we're getting is really, really suited to your sort of focus. It's a very city of devils, Shanghai. And Some of the listeners are going to know exactly what that means, and others, I think, are just sitting there guessing. So can you relay this vision of Shanghai to the uninitiated? Ah. Well, I suppose the the Shanghai I'm talking about is really, uh, and that Lin Yutang is talking about in this piece, is really between the wars, the period between the world wars. Uh, Shanghai is, of course, a treaty port. It is uh, divided into the international settlement. Uh, and the French concession. Now, it's important to understand that although we often refer to Shanghai at this period as colonial, um, it wasn't technically a colony. So perhaps semi-colonial is, is, is a better term for it. Mm. Anyway, it is, uh, it's not a colony in the way that uh, Hong Kong or Singapore were, were, were colonies of the British. It mm. is an international settlement. And within that, it has a system called 
extraterritoriality or extrality, which is a bizarre sort of system whereby you are, you as a foreigner in an area are not governed by uh, the, the laws of that the country that you're in, China, to, to all intents and purposes. You are governed by the laws of your own country. And, and, and that, of course, leads to all sorts of complications and, and mix-ups and makes it very complicated. But you basically have an international police force, international justice systems. Uh, you have an uh, organization, the municipal council, which is run by, effectively elected by the ratepayers, who until sort of the, the late 1930s did not include the Chinese in Shanghai, uh, but did include all the other nationalities. Um, so it, it, it's a hybrid sort of place. There aren't many examples of this sort of uh, place in history. The closest would probably be, well, for a while, Constantinople, it's now Istanbul perhaps better known Tangier, although that was mm. the sort of more of a protectorate than, you know, this was the Shanghai, of course, was protected by the Royal Navy, the French Navy, the American Navy, and the Marines and various regiments were stationed there. So it was an interesting place. Yet it is a contradiction because it is, it is a treaty port that is ripped from China by violence and aggression in the Opium Wars. Um, and Britain decides that this is one of the places they want to take as a treaty port because they can enforce the unequal treaties on, on the Qing dynasty, and they do. Very good reason for it. For Shanghai, always, of course, geography is destiny. It's the head of the Yangtze. Everything in, everything out goes through Shanghai, and there's a lot of commissions and money to be made on that business. And controlling it, of course, means you can control the trade. So, it, it, is, it is these things. It, it, it is colonial in the sense that it is ripped from China. It is forced from them at gunpoint. And yet it becomes a refuge, a sort of port of last resort for so many people, primarily for Chinese people, you know, who are fleeing, well, you know, warlordism, the Taiping Rebellion, flood, famine, disease, you know, everything you can imagine and come to Shanghai where there maybe is opportunity. Um, it then, of course, receives... 25, 30,000 Russian exiles after the Bolshevik Revolution, the, the so-called white Russian, the Russian emigres who come and settle in the city. In the late 1930s, it receives another 20, 25,000 Jewish refugees from Europe who are fleeing fascism. So it becomes, and, and along the way, of course, as you'll know if you've read anything by me, because of this bizarre legal system there and so on, and it also being the only place in the world, which is why so many Russians and Jews came there, that you didn't need to have passport or an entry visa or, an, or even declare your, your real name. Uh, and the only place in the world where you could do that, Casablanca is an invention of Hollywood. It's only really Shanghai. Uh, it, of course, attracted many uh, people that were on the run. Uh, from from their own legal systems, uh, gangsters, basically. So Shanghai is this contradiction. It is a place that is created in violence and yet does so much to save various groups of people and allow them to prosper um, and becomes this repository of East and West culture, which I know you've talked about before on your show. And it's more complicated than just East and West. It is, you know, these refugee Jews, these refugee Russians, different groups of Chinese coming in. Um, and the most important thing as well, I think, to think of at this time, certainly by the 1930s, when Lin Yutang writes his hymn to Shanghai, is we're talking about the world's fourth largest city, London, Paris, New York. And then it's a tie between Berlin and Shanghai. Though of those four or five cities uh, with massive populations at this time, Shanghai is by far the most densely populated and also by far the most cosmopolitan and international of these cities, at least in terms of numbers of people. So I think this is kind of um, uh, the fascinating contradictions of, of Shanghai. And if you want to understand what Lu, Lin Yutang and others who are writing about Shanghai at this time are talking about, you have to understand this kind of, um, the, the, this massive contradiction between uh, Shanghai as a, a, a colonial possession and, and Shanghai as a refuge. About every 30 seconds there through the story of Shanghai you were giving me, I was thinking of something from my experiences in modern day Shanghai that echoed this kind of amazing past. Um, I'll just go for one. It was kind of a strange trip I did. I was, I'd done this kind of trip going up to northern China, um, looking across the North Korean border, going through Korea, going through Japan. And then I decided to get the boat back from Japan, which was kind of a bad choice because it was two nights um, on my own, which was very dull. But the end of the trip was fantastic because um, the boat went right up the Yangtze until it got to the, the ferry dock. So we got this kind of very slow um, view of both sides of the city. So Pushi and Pudong 
and you it, you could see all these different kind of levels of development and layers of history and a thing that really struck me uh, was pretty early on the boat went past quite a lot of um i guess chinese navy warships and maybe that's like the really big difference is that before you couldn't particularly say who who owns this place it's divvied up in such a strange way whereas now it's it is a it is at least it's in chinese hands if we can say it's a chinese city but um yeah i'm i'm starting to waffle here my next question is probably one you've kind of already answered but um what draws you to the kind of city of devils incarnation of shanghai is it more than just the contradictions that make you interested in it well i do think shanghai was a, a fascinating city and if you come at it from looking at it trying to understand it as a chinese city in a peculiar situation or a unique situation if you try to understand it uh, in terms of, uh, of the foreigners who were living there and what they what they were trying to do there it, in, in all ways it's a fascinating city and then mm. that fusion between the two and of course you know what creates so much of what you saw on your boat trip as you were coming up the river mm -hmm. is is sort of interesting and also the fact that you know again the geography defines things so you know if you look at shanghai it's it's an odd city given that it has a major river running through it now this is a really important thing for a successful city um having rivers run through them i mean beijing is one of the few sort of major cities in the world that doesn't have a river running through it because right. of course it was a sort of mongolian camel camp back in the day <laughs> that sort of grew and grew and grew it always annoys people in beijing but that's kind of what it was it grew wonderfully but you know it started off that way so it wasn't next to a river most other people would build next to a river um except of course the international settlement uh, didn't really have control over the other side of the river what is mm. now pudong putting aside all of the canards about it was just a fishing village in pudong and there was nothing ever there which is all nonsense and it's a good way to tell if someone is bsing when they tell you about shanghai if they say they were ever in shanghai looked across the river and there was nothing but farmland you, you know they're just telling you lies or <laughs> or they're 180 years old oh, someone has lied to me then some <laughs> oh yeah it still goes on I, i'm having an argument with someone just today actually who maintained that when they got to shanghai in like 2003 or something pudong was just a fishing village uh, and you're like, mm. well you know <laughs> there may not have been as much there as there is now but it was never a fishing village if you look back at shanghai of course shanghai before treaty port days was a walled city and of course you can still see the mm. original uh, old city there nantau uh, and so on and it was a walled city the wall sadly is pretty much gone in fact now most of the old city is pretty much gone which is tragic but you can see it and you can still clearly identify the the the, the route that the wall took um now why you know, why was it walled well of course like a lot of cities along that coast towns and cities along that coast it was walled against the the japanese pirates that raided along that coast so why would the city of shanghai be walled and then there'd just be a fishing village over in pudong it doesn't even make any sense right anyway you can you can see you know shanghai extended to the the west go from the bund and go up the yanan expressway what was the avenue edward the 7th and go all the way up that and of course it runs out to the west out towards hongqiao and so on mm. um what it doesn't have unlike most other cities that are built on rivers is is until more, more recently uh, any bridges across it right um right. which is sort of odd i mean you know how many bridges are there across the thames or the seine or the neva or 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 you know into and out of uh, manhattan and so on you know mm. uh there really was uh, for many many years only really the one bridge and now now there's a couple more but there's still none in the center um right. so yeah. uh you know it was it didn't develop that way which if you think about it is a bit odd right compared mm. to most other cities that are built on rivers um and now of course you know of course you can tunnel under it a million times rather than have bridges but mm. uh it, it's kind of interesting that you know you don't look out <clears throat> from the bund and see five bridges down around the curve of the river there right in the way that you would do at pretty much any point along the thames or the seine or, or you know most yeah. major rivers um so again now i'm waffling away from your point but yes the the layers the layers of history are there it always used to fascinate me if you stood on the on on the bund which of course now really is raised then you could look across you you would see who was looking which way you know and invariably uh, the chinese uh, the internal tourists who were there visiting would look across at pudong particularly in more recent last 15 years or so right. uh, they would look across at pudong and that would speak to them of all sorts of things about um the china that they live in tourists and and me 
really, and a few others, would sort of gaze the other way and wonder, uh, you know, about those buildings and, and, and what was there. Of course, at the Bund itself is, is, is uh, the Bund itself is sort of fascinating um, in that uh, back in the sort of 1980s when I was first in Shanghai and then in the 1990s living there, it was dark. I mean, it really they didn't light it up at night. That no one was really encouraged to go there. There weren't really any businesses there or anything. Most of those buildings were empty or at least uh, subdivided up a million times with different families. We used to be able to go around the back streets there on um, on what is now uh, uh, off the back of. Um, uh, uh, Guangdong Lu and various other li- and, and climb up the fire escapes at the back mm. and get onto the roofs of those buildings in an oh, almost sort of Batman like thing. I remember a <clears throat> Armenian guy that came to Shanghai very early and opened a uh, tango club up there and he used to tango <laughs> up on the roof with various people and you could literally sit up there with some cans of uh, Qingdao or even worse Reeb and and kind of smoke your uh, cigarettes and and look across at, uh, at 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 them building the Pearl Oriental tower wondering what the hell that was going to look like when it was finished um and that's not that long ago no Um, no the 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 government really didn't bother much with them with with the bund um so so things like that have changed massively even if when you go past you think to yourself quite rightly there is that kind of old shanghai the majestic sweep of the uh, of the bund along the river and on the other side this incredible kind of manhattan skyline that's been built And, and that's a very obvious way of thinking about it and then you think to yourself Wow, what really was underneath that Manhattan skyline? What was the old Pudong? What was there? And the answer is quite a lot, mm. uh, uh, but not very high level. And what was on, um, you know, what, what, why was the Bund uh, so downplayed in terms of, uh, of history? I, mean, I remember going to a, a person's leaving party. I don't know if this is interesting to people, maybe it is. I remember going to someone who'd been a teacher for a while who was leaving in about 1993. And, um, the, the thing they did on their last night after two years in Shanghai was was go down to the Bund, right? Hmm. Because um, it w- they'd never been in the two years that they were there because <laughs> they'd, ne- they'd never seen a reason to go there. There wasn't anything to do when you got there, right? So, oh, so like, they didn't go. Now I imagine it's probably where, you know, obviously I know it's where people go first off, right? And hmm. all of the luxury shops and the, the restaurants and hotels that have gone in there. I mean, that, it's all so much, so much later. When I was living in China, my mom visited not once but twice, and we went by the Bund uh, both times. And the second time, it was kind of that was the only place she wanted to be. That was <laughs> that and other hotels. Yeah, I mean, I have to I have to give a shout out to um, to Michelle Garneau there for M on the Bund. I mean, you know, and I remember she started off doing a, a sort of a guest residency, really, at, at the Majestic Hotel. Uh, not the Majestic Hotel. Sorry, we're coming on to talk about the Majestic Hotel mm. at the um, at the well, then called the Peace Hotel, of course, formerly Sir Victor Sassoon's Cafe Hotel, um, and now having gone through another refurbishment. At this point, it wasn't as as spruced up as it is now. And um, she she obviously decided she liked it, and th- and then went on and and took the the premises she has at uh, what is she at three or four. Uh, uh, Bund. So um, it was kind of, uh, you know, she, she, she kind of got things rolling a little bit down there and then property developers got in and started um, re- rejuvenating some of the buildings down there. But I mean, a lot of it is, is re- really quite recent, certainly 21st century. Mm. No, I never would have known these things if you hadn't told me. Um, <laughs> l- last old Shanghai question. This is, um, again, maybe one we've already partly answered, um, but for you, do other episodes or places in Chinese or world history compare with what we saw in this old Shanghai, maybe in like other Chinese concession cities? Well, I think that we probably um, uh, obsess about Shanghai. I know I certainly obsess about Shanghai, although I, I admit that there, there's there are other reasons to be obsessed about Shanghai. Its rejuvenation is fascinating. Its dialect is fascinating. Mm. Its cuisine is fascinating. Its musical heritage is fascinating. Its general embrace of modernity. If, like me, you are someone who loves modernism in all of its forms around the world, mm-hmm. you know, for, I don't know, from from Joyce to to to, to Lao Shu or something, right? Then, um, you know, uh, Shanghai is a very important city. Uh, we can talk a little bit about the impact of modernism and, you know, the more showy parts of modernism like Art Deco and the more deeper intellectual parts of that. Um, but I think, you know, Tianjin, the old Tianjin, probably doesn't get quite as much attention as it should. 
and uh, there's been a lot there, there was obviously so much that went on in Tianjin. It, it was a slightly smaller sister to shanghai a treaty port of course um but again has its own fascinating history being effectively the port for beijing um mm -hmm. it, it, it's kind of a fascinating city and has gone through its own uh, specific renaissance and um you know in terms of heritage and preservation there's quite a lot that's gone on there good and bad in Tianjin, so we probably should think about that more. The other smaller treaty ports are all fascinating to visit. I mean, you know, Xiamen and Fuzhou and, and various other places. Um, but but Shanghai is, of course, the big beast of of the treaty ports. It was where the bulk of the money was made. And by the time that Lin Yutang's writing in the mid 1930s, you know, of course, everything is you know uh, the the capital is just up the road at Nanjing. Um, mm. Shanghai is really where the money is to a slightly lesser degree Tian, Tianjin and Peking or well, Beiping Beijing is by this point really um, an intellectual center a place where there's lots of interesting people gathering um, <clears throat> Chinese culture Chinese religion as well as um, the sort of foreign aesthetes the, the Harold Actons and Desmond, Desmond Parsons and Lawrence Sickmans and all of those people who are fascinating they are drawn to um, Beijing um, and, and the money, uh, the money, and the, and the and the jazz, and all of that is is concentrated in Shanghai. Yeah, and we might come back a bit to contrasting those two um, mega cities later in the episode. So we're going to go on, march on from old Shanghai to the man Lin Yutang himself. Um, so yeah, you mentioned that we covered Hai Pai on the show before, and that was um, mostly in the Book of Shanghai episode with Karen Wang. We kind of touched on it but there's definitely i think more we could say about that um we've already kind of used the term a little bit and i think it's probably going to come up when we talk about um lin yutang so my first question about him is who was this lin yutang what's he got to do with shanghai and what's he got to do with hai pai the mixing cultural mixing of um eastern and western things Lin Yutang is originally from Fujian, but he comes to Shanghai to study at the St. John's University, which was um, uh, out, out now the um, Shanghai Political and Economic University, I think it is, just by Zhongshan Park, the old Jessfield Park to, to the west of the city. Um, he studies there. He then goes to America, as so many uh, uh, intellectuals, uh, Chinese intellectuals did at that time, um, to... Uh, to, to study at uh, Harvard, I think. Uh, he comes back and um, spends a lot of time in Shanghai and, and really becomes a kind of, um, I don't really like uh, this idea of saying, you know, a Chinese person is sort of, you know, the, the Chinese version of this person, but it maybe helps people get in, into their head who this sort of person is. I think he becomes almost like a kind of Joseph Roth of, of, of China. He writes these shorter pieces, essays. He's thinking a lot about the political situation, but he's also thinking about culture. He's thinking about um, things in China. Ooh, I mean, you know, he's thinking about the, con he writes about the concept of face, the concept of mm. manners. Uh, humor. He thinks a lot about the notion of humor in, in China. And uh, uh, he thinks about Confucian. I mean, we're going through another cycle of this now. But he thinks about Confucianism and what it means for uh, nationalist China. And he thinks about love. He thinks, you know, which again is something a lot of people are writing on at the moment. He thinks about um, concepts of love and, and 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 so on he is if you like somewhat of a dandy he is somewhat of a stylist which i think makes him appeal to me he is uh i think if i had to describe him you know i'd say he is a liberal cosmopolitan yeah. and that draws him somewhat to to shanghai his politics are liberal he he is he is at times sympathetic towards the emergent communist party he is at times critical of of chiang kai-shek's nationalist government he's a liberal he sits somewhere in between he he interacts in shanghai with a lot of the left-wing writers lu shun bajin bajin now of course considered a left-wing writer i mean was really more of a, just an anarchist back mm. in the day um, um and, and and others that are there um and so i think if i compared him with anyone i would think of him within china more in line with lao she perhaps who, who he was friends with and did publish um and as well as some overseas uh, Chinese writers, uh, one that I've talked about a lot because we did a blue plaque to him in Oxford last year, Chiang Yi, the, the artist and poet who was living in London at, uh, at this time. But someone who wrote about, you know, sort of the world through a Chinese lens, if you like. And we don't have many writers that did that. Um, Xiao Qian, Traveller Without a Map, 
Chiang Yi, the Silent Traveller series, um, and many of the essays of Lin Yu Tang, uh, his kind of how to live the Chinese way of life, that books that were around subjects like that are very interesting. And later on, he became a great, he left uh, China in 1936, went to America and became a great, throughout the Second World War, became a great interpreter of China to um, the rest of the Western world at a time when China was, of course, an ally in the struggle against fascism and Japanese militarism. Um, so he's also someone I think it's quite important to understand who never really takes a strident position. I mean, we live in an era now, and it was like this in the 30s, where people felt they had to take a very strident position. Really? And I have anyone... noticed. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, anyone who was against you or took a different position was just there to be, you know, at best um, shouted down, at worst taken out and shot. Right. So um, it, it, he, he comes at a time then, a little bit like the time that we seem to be in at the moment, where people took a very strong position. And he never does that. So, for instance, um, he had been raised or uh, largely in, in a Christian tradition as well as a Confucian tradition. And at times in his life, right through to the end of his life, he went to America for a long time and then eventually died in um, Taiwan. And if you go to Taipei, his house in Taipei mm. now is a museum complete with his library, which you can get up close and have a good look at. I've taken lots of pictures of his bookshelves in, in Taipei, and he's buried at uh, Yang Mingshan Cemetery in, in Taipei as well. Um, but all his life, he kind of, you know, uh, rejected Christianity and then at various times came closer again to Christian uh, Christianity, which is partly uh, infuses this hymn to Shanghai. Um, at times, he feels himself drawn to the left of politics. At times, he feels himself drawn back to the right of politics. At times, he feels himself very nationalistic. At other times, he feels himself very kind of critical of, of Chinese society and culture. Um, and in his writing style, he sometimes wants to become, you know, almost uh, kind of uh, fancy free uh, in, his, in his stylings and his writings and almost ephemeral, almost becomes ephemeral. And at other times, he wants to be absolutely spot on and make his point Mm -hmm. and, and be quite quite critical so he, he's not someone and perhaps this is harder makes him harder to grab hold of and why he doesn't necessarily why he hasn't had quite the renaissance that he perhaps deserved compared to other writers of that period is that he doesn't sit easily in one camp or another so for instance you know no one in in china now is quite sure what to do with lin yu tang mm. well a lot of people in the West who want to take a very strong position about cultural appropriation and various other things, they're not quite sure what to do with Lin Yu Tang either, because at times he embraces the idea of cultural appropriation uh, and, and, and mixing and mashing and fusion and blending. And at other times he, he walks, he walks it back, if you like, and finds himself drawn more towards the away from the Shanghai high pie, more towards the kind of Beijing Jing pie of getting back to, you know, the essentials, of uh, mm. Confucianism and opera and, and the classics. And, and you know, he, he was very influential in introducing the Chinese classics to, to Western audiences as well. So that's what one of the things that makes him very interesting is that he isn't someone who, who's very easy to, to stick in a box and say, this is where he sits on the political spectrum or on the uh, literary spectrum or on, on the social spectrum. He, he, he moves around and is very fluid. And I think that's why I would emphasize as well as liberal, he was cosmopolitan. Mm -hmm. But in being cosmopolitan, and again, this is an argument that we have to have, um, certainly in the United Kingdom at the moment, I'm sure, is, you know, this, this, I, this idea that is now floated that somehow to be cosmopolitan is to not be um, true to your country, if you like. Right? Yeah, you know, this idea that disconnected you know, this from the Theresa people. May nonsense of, you know, if you consider yourself a citizen of, of uh, you know, what was her thing, you know, a citizen of nowhere or whatever, right? I mean, that's not what cosmopolitanism is, right? It's being misinterpreted by people who are using nationalism for, for other ends, which, which, of course, was a problem on both the right and left in China in the 1930s as well. And so walking the middle line of cosmopolitanism has, has always been uh, slightly tricky. And maintaining yourself as a liberal in very politically polarized times is always very tricky as well. And Lin Yutang does it, and not only does he do it, but he does it with a certain humor, which is not something that we associate with many uh, Chinese writers. Um, and, and so that makes him also a little bit different for, for, from many others. But as I say, at the moment, he's, he's kind of been a little bit forgotten, uh, certainly outside of Taiwan. China's not quite sure what to do with him. He hasn't had a renaissance. People don't have very strong feelings with him. I mean, you right. know, I mean, 
anything you say about anyone at Shanghai at this time, particularly Eileen Chang, Zhang Eileen, or I find Emily Hahn, if you want to find a Westerner that was there at that time. I mean, people really feel um, very close to those writers. And you look at the arguments that are going on now about the film that hardly anyone's even seen yet, Anne Hui's uh, a movie adaptation of Love After Love, right? You know, and I'm already seeing lots of arguments for why it's why it's betraying Eileen Chang, why, why it's a support, you know. I mean, people mm. really get passionate about Eileen Chang. They don't get passionate about Lin Yu Tang in quite the in quite the same way um mm -hmm. so so i think he's due a he's due a revival um but his yeah. revival is will be part of hopefully our return to more more liberal values rather than just um all becoming isolated and balkanized mm. uh, and when i look over my uh, episode play stats some of the like on the main feed the ones that get the most hits are like the first episode which I think that's just because it's the first episode, but also it's Lucian, Diary of a Madman. And then another one of the front runners is uh, the one I did on Lost Caution, Alien Chung. But then when I look on uh, the episodes on YouTube where I've put them up and where maybe, I don't know, there's a different sort of mass uh, audience seems like an overly grandiose word, but you know, it's that's a huge internet zone. And the play count for my upload of the Alien Chang episode is just miles ahead of all the other episodes. So I know that like online, she's her name is like a magnet in a way that none of the other authors I've, I've covered are. And I, I don't imagine Lin Yu Tang is going to have the same um, star power. But um, <laughs> well, yeah. people do. People feel so uh, possessive of, of Eileen Chang and everyone mm. has a very strong view of her. And of course, you know, the estate has been very clever with Eileen Chang in that it has done a lot to try and control her legacy and right. what people know and don't know about her. And has also, um, you know, has all these untranslated books, right? Which it's sort of slowly <laughs> releasing or allowing to be filmed or allowed to be published or so on. And that's kind of um, very clever. So there's always new stuff coming. Whereas mm. with most of these writers, we don't have any new stuff coming, right? With Eileen Chang, we know that a couple of years down the line, there could be a new novel that, that they, they've got in Los Angeles and, and haven't done yet. So, that's that kind of makes her interesting um but but people feel a, a sense of ownership with eileen chang I, I wrote something um which i keep meaning to write more about because i have a lot of information about her first um freelance work you know which was oh. film reviews film reviews and fashion uh but it was all done for a nazi funded uh magazine oh no <laughs> and of course uh, yeah and it was uh, klaus uh, uh meinhardt's uh, 20th century magazine which you can you can see online um, I, which I'm always pointing people to because they don't believe me. Um, mm. And of course, at that time, which is the other thing that's often downplayed, her husband at that time was part of Wang Jingwei's mm -hmm. uh, 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 puppet traitor government. Um, and so she got in with Meinhardt, who was a German Nazi. And uh, he was sent to, from, he was teaching in Hawaii and he was sent to Shanghai. And uh, he was given a lot of money to set up a magazine in English called 20th Century, which at the time had a pretty... Uh, a, a, a pretty smart look. It was almost like to, uh, a competitor and sort of fascist competitor to Time or Life magazine, those kind of magazines, Picture Post, that kind of thing. Lots of essays in there, lots of interesting things. It's well worth people having a look at it online. All sorts of things about the, um, I mean, you know, if you're interested in all these uh, uh, an anthropology of um, um, Tibetans and Mongolians and trying to link them in with Aryans and things. Oh, no. Lots of stuff, lots of stuff attacking the British and the Americans, of course. And in there is um, Eileen Chang on, on fashions in Shanghai. I mean, you know, no, no great Nazi content, lots of lovely illustrations with it. And she's talking about where skirt lengths are this year, you know, and where, but it's all in occupied Shanghai, Japanese occupied mm. Shanghai. And then there's some film reviews, which are a little more tricky. Um, yeah, and, and I just happened to mention these a few times. And, and the idea that Eileen Chang worked with the Nazis um, does get a little bit of a response out there, I must admit. I Some imagine. people are not very happy about that. That's not how they saw Eileen Chang. Mm. But that's how she got her start. So, so I feel people are very proprietorial about these sort of writers. Emily Hahn is um, the same from a sort of Western perspective. Actually, it, to a lot of people, Edgar Snow is, um, is, is very much... Edgar Snow, who didn't like Lin Yu Tang, disliked Lin Yu Tang intensely. Oh, no. Um, uh, well, I mean, you know, count, count yourself privileged to be in the group of people that uh, Edgar Snow disliked intensely, <laughs> I think. Um, <laughs> it, I mean, a fairly awful man, in my opinion. But um, he kind of... And then again, that will, that will spark people off. But, uh, you know, I can give you all the reasons why I think he's awful on another podcast. But, you know, uh, this is a time when people are very, very divided 
um, you mm. know, and so and so people are and, and are having to make choices that you can't necessarily understand in hindsight, you know. Right. Um, and and if you want to be a freelance journalist, these are the outlets you have. And and Germany and German fascism feels a long way away at the time. If I wanted to defend Eileen Chang, I could argue, right? Um, and she just wants to get a start in the business. Um, you know, of course, someone like Edgar Snow, who's much revered now, of course, has by this time tied his uh, tied his cart to mouse horses. And uh, you know, anyone who isn't fully on board is, is against them, right? So Lin Yu Tung, because of this liberal, liberal cosmopolitanism, is again seen as being outside the tent at this point as well. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So going going back to Lin Yu Tang, I'll quickly tell you the story of how I was exposed to him. Um, and I think it th- this raises a a kind of a, an angle of looking at his writing we've not covered yet. So this was when I was near the end of my brief stint working in like a training school, English training school style thing. And there was a an older English guy working there. Um, he probably wouldn't be too mad if I said he was a bit of like a lovable grouch sort of character. And he quite liked his, his books and his reading. And that was something me and him could talk about. I think he saw me reading... Um, uh the rebel by Camus one time and then from then on i was in his good books so towards the end of my stay uh or my time working in that company he needed to get rid of some of his books as you know a foreigner relocating in shanghai often does and he he kind of dumped a pile of them on me and said take whatever you like and he said take whatever you like but you have to take this one this what he said something like this will help you understand um chinese people it's the perfect guide and it was um the art of living by lin yutang so yes, yes. I was very interested in reading it based on the strength of his recommendation. But a statement like this is the guide to the Chinese mind, I was kind of dubious about, you know, sound, sounds a bit dated, the idea that you could have an idea to any kind of national psyche. And yet that's part of what Lin Yutang was doing in that book. It's something that you probably wouldn't try and write or no one would publish today. He, there's even a really funny part of the book where he tries to, it's almost like top Trump's cards for the different nations of the world. He tries to rate them on different scales. And an, another thing that popped into my head when you're talking about some of the articles he wrote, this uh, this one that we got today, I sourced online from um, the China Heritage Quarterly. And there's various pieces, um, articles, Lin was writing in Shanghai at the time. And yeah, they're often writing about Chinese culture in a way that tries to describe the thing and the people as a whole. Um, so what, what I'm trying to say is you, you were saying things how he's sometimes on one side, sometimes on the other. And I feel like another thing we could say about him is some of the things he says are really evergreen and don't date in the way that other more maybe politically obsessive writers things they've written have maybe dated. They don't, they're not universally applicable. So he's written some things that are very witty and amusing and have like ticked the literature box of being evergreen. And then there's other things that you kind of have to take with a pinch of salt, um, where he says very essentializing things about a nationality or womankind. He seems pretty fixated on what women are all about a lot of the time. Yeah, how, how do you, what do you think of those sort of things when they pop up in his writing? Oh, I, I think obviously we have to, I mean, you know, we have to read read him within his time, mm. and and read him within his his culture as well, and what he's trying to do. And I think you have to understand that he's he's trying to deal with um with with having been born in Fujian, you know, uh, outside of a big city, to having uh, been born into uh, uh, to having become a Christian Mm -hmm. to having to have come to the big city and gone to university. I mean, lots of these things affect all of us. And, and, you know, we have to try and work out the society we're in. He's also in a society in flux. Um, If effectively uh, really by the time this essay is written that we're talking about today, Japan has announced its intention to to go to war completely with, with China and particularly with Shanghai, which it has done several years before in 1932, Mm. it started the attack. So if you like, if you go back to 1930, uh, you know, and and think of the Japanese annexation of Manchuria, the the war with Japan is already on. Right. Um, So, so he's in this, so that's drawing him backwards and forwards in thinking about that. He's in Shanghai with all the high pie stuff going on. There's a lot as the academics say these days, for him to unpack about yeah. about the country and the time he's living in. And it's going to also feel very different to how we think at the time. And there's not many people in China doing this at this point. And in fact, eventually, I think you know, he has to leave China uh, to do this. And other people who were thinking like this are Chinese who've gone to America or, I mean, I happen to be 
hopefully doing a project for the BBC soon on um, on ones that came to the UK. Chiang Yi, uh, the journalist Xiao Chen, who was the only Chinese foreign correspondent in Europe during the Second World War. Um, Chiang Yi, the artist. Uh, um, um, several playwrights and poets that, that settled in in London and, and started to work out ideas like this, trying to understand things. Sometimes you have to put a bit of distance between yourself and um, and the culture that you're in. Totally. Um, and and I think that's also again why you know this age old sort of silly argument that. Um, that, uh, that, that foreigners in China always have. And when I say age old, I mean like 170 years old argument about, you know, Shanghai versus Beijing. And it's a, sorry, it's a very stupid argument. But, um, you know, people take a certain position, uh, largely depending on where their university sent them to learn Chinese, um, <laughs> you know, uh, rather than any sort of you know, uh, uh, reason for this, uh, concrete reason. Um, and, and of course, you know, I'm, I'm in the loop, the Lin Yu Tang camp, which, which loves both cities mm. um, for different reasons and flows backwards and forwards. I mean, there, there's another essay he writes around the time called something like Pei Ping, because the capital had moved to Nanjing. If people don't know, uh, Beijing, Peking's name had technically changed to, to uh, Pei Ping or Bei Ping, city of, of peace. Um, right. Uh, and, and, uh, you know, uh, so, so it's called uh, paping of the soul and he's trying to work out you know what it is he likes about Beijing and what he doesn't like about Beijing in the way that in him to Shanghai he's become very cross with Shanghai at, at, at this point in his in his life and again it's not a it's not a fixed thing he's never a kind of person who's like well I live in Shanghai so therefore Shanghai is better than Beijing <laughs> or I live in Beijing so therefore Beijing's better than Shanghai it's a kind of you know what are the elements in both these cities and what are the elements that I feel are important whether it be modernism or religion whether it be uh, my traditions the traditions of China or the exciting things I'm seeing coming in through Shanghai right you know, on the sort of cultural conveyor belt that, that a port city like Shanghai is at any point. Um, and I think that that's kind of interesting. And he's also looking, as we can come on to talk about, he's looking at Shanghai and thinking, you know, he's annoyed in, in him to Shanghai about the vulgarity of Shanghai. And this is something that I think is something that's often said about Shanghai now. And no one really looks at the historical roots of this. Why is Shanghai seen as money obsessed and vulgar and, and gaudy, right, compared to compared to Beijing? You know, what, why is that? And at this point, he's very annoyed about that vulgarity. He thinks it's destructive. And so he's drawn towards the what he sees, rightly or wrongly, as the, as the sort of, you know, uh, reality, the sort of core truth of, of, of Beijing, as opposed to the imposed cosmopolitanism, bohemianism, uh, modernity of, of Shanghai. And he's always moving between those two positions. And that's something that I think is um, very useful to think about. So you mentioned uh, the Japanese uh, invasion of, of China and Shanghai, and that's reminded me something um, I need to kind of give just as a disclaimer. Um, I've cheated slightly on this episode. So on everything we've done before in the Translated Chinese Fiction podcast, and I'm speaking to the listeners here mostly, has been something written in uh, Chinese, translated into English. We're looking at the English version. This time, um, it's been reversed slightly. Uh, we're reading the English version of Him to Shanghai, which Lin Yutang wrote in 1930. And he did he self-translated it to Chinese three years later in 1933. And he made a few tweaks that we might talk about later. Um, I learned this. I, I, Paul himself had told me that Lin was a, a self-translator. And I found a little bit of, uh, I think it's, it's someone's master's thesis I found online. So I'll just quickly read an excerpt of that. Again, just as a disclaimer, <laughs> so we're, we're being clear about this. So it says here, the English essay was written in 1930 when international settlement, chiefly of Western countries, had been established for over 60 years and colonialism existed for more than half a century in Shanghai. The Chinese essay was published in 1933, one year after Shanghai was attacked by Japan and would soon be weathered with raids, invasions and outright occupation by the Japanese till the mid 40s. Do I want to keep going? Huh. Have I stapled these in the wrong order? <laughs> I have. Oh, geez. Yeah. The changing political environment forced Lin to change his way of critique. A direct one was replaced by a concealed one disguised under a veil of humor. But yeah, we'll, um, we'll come back to talk about some of the differences in the, in the translation later. Just now, I have a question about Lin Yutang and Art Deco. Are you ready for that one? Yes. Okay. It'll be fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. So it's not 
technically just about Art Deco because you mentioned yeah. earlier that Lynn is a really big, um, I don't know what's the right word, a lover of modernism. He's really um, invested in this artistic movement and he was involved, like you said, with some of the other writers um, who were resident and writing in Shanghai at the time. But what's all that got to do with Art Deco in Shanghai? And what's Art, Ge what's Art Deco got to do with Shanghai, we should probably say as well? Well, I think... Um... When, when people come to Shanghai, one of the things that often foreigners like, and, and the Chinese themselves like, from, as you can see from a million kind of Art Deco themed uh, old Shanghai cafes that pop up and, and, and close down with incredible rapidity, is that uh, it is something that people like a lot and they, they feel very drawn to. This is true sort of around the world of Art Deco. Um, an art form, you know, that really inf inflected so many things uh, between the wars. One of the things that that probably, uh, you know, I, I'm always asked about Art Deco because I write about China at this period. And to me, Art Deco is a very interesting uh, way of looking at Shanghai. Um, normally, they just say, look, here's all the Art Deco. Doesn't this show that this is an international city? Um, they were building Art Deco, foreign architects, then some Chinese architects decided to sort of do their version of Art Deco. And isn't that interesting? And now whenever we build anything, like um, when the Kadoris came back and, and built the new uh, Peninsula Hotel uh, on the, on the um, Bund, down near the old uh, British consulate, they decided to do it in an Art Deco style, mostly an American Art Deco style, which you wouldn't really find elsewhere much in, in Shanghai. So there's all mm. sorts of problems around there. What Lin Yu Tung found around Art Deco and around and what a lot of people found around this time is that to many people, Art Deco now, of course, it's looked back on nostalgically and people find it interesting. They like finding it in junk shops and, and they like building it. And of course, it has its fans. There are Art Deco societies. There are Art Deco fans, conferences. on. But essentially what they don't like to talk about is the fact that many, many people at the time and still today, in my case, for instance, find Art Deco to be vulgar. Um, it is a, a vulgar uh, art form for, for many, many reasons. It's an urban vernacular culture. It's reasonably shallow, I would argue, and I think many art critics would argue it requires no real great depth of aesthetic um, experience to enjoy it. It, it. It's of the mass, it's factory produced. It's, it's also about verticality. So if you want to know where Pudong begins, it begins, of course, as a response to the Art Deco verticality of Pushi. Right. With the idea of go higher, higher, higher. Mm. This is one of the things that Yin, Lin Yutang found vulgar about Shanghai. And of course, thinking at the time, the mid 1930s of the, the absolute opposite of verticality being Beijing at that time, a city then largely of hutongs and, lo and low level uh, buildings, no, no high buildings really at all at that time. So, so Lin is, is repulsed by the vulgarity that is most obvious in Art Deco, this sort of shallow version of uh, modernism. Um, and he refers to it. He talks about, uh, in, an, in an introduction he wrote to this essay, he talks about, uh, where is it? He says it. Um, he talks about uh, the vulgarities, uh, the strange mixture. Shanghai is terrible in her strange mixture of Eastern and Western vulgarity, in her superficial refinement in her naked and unmasked worship of mammon, or money, in her emptiness, and in her bad taste. Now, this is not um, how many people who are very loving of old Shanghai like to think of it, right? <laughs> this is not mm. what they want to think about when they think about it. I can hear he some then, fans booing right now. He then goes on to refer to the, uh, the stupid and vulgar faces that appeared at the Majestic, well, a night, nightclub at that time. And, he, and again, he uses vulgar and in the uh, but this is in the introduction and he doesn't when he translated it as we say into chinese he didn't translate that introduction so mm. we, we don't know what word he would have used for vulgar as he translated it i mean the word i would use i mean it would be just yongsu right i mean just just vulgar in that way but there are other words he could have used more vernacular words and more dismissive uh, words to describe art deco so it's, it's interesting that, that Shanghai, as I've said before, you know, it is a colonial city that also became a refuge, but it is also a city of modernism, very genuine modernism in many ways, mm. particularly if we look at, look at the work people like Lim Pan, who introduced me to Lin Yu Tang, by the way, who's a, who's a great writer and a great lady of Shanghai, um, you know, has done on typography and magazine design and things like this. Some of the writing that we see at that time that I've, I worked with um, Andrew Field, who's now at Duke University 
in Kunshan um, on translating, or he did the translations, uh, Mu She Ying, who is again a, a, a much overlooked now, purposefully overlooked, because like Eileen Chang's husband, he went with Wang Jingwei and was assassinated for that, who wrote many right. uh, high modernist short stories in a great modernist uh, tradition. Um, so, so it's a city of, mo- of real modernism, but it's also a city of vulgar mass-produced modernism, which I would describe as Art Deco. Um, mm. Someone, someone in, in a European uh, context called Art Deco um, modernism for the uneducated, right? <laughs> so, so, <laughs> so, oh, so no. one of the, when we look at Shanghai, I think it's really important not to sort of look at it and go, wow, look at the Art Deco. And of course, I don't advocate knocking down any of that Art Deco. I, I'd like to save it all. But I think when I, when I look at it, I see something slightly different to the great fans of Art Deco. I see that as really the, the, the apex between the wars of the vulgar Garity. and as uh, as as Lin Yu Tang would have said, you know the uh, the bad taste, the 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 emptiness, the unmasked worship of mammon, the superficial refinement. Um, so this is the alternative analysis of high pi, which is that you know it is um, it is it is a strange mixture of Eastern and Western vulgarity, and I think that you know that that is um, quite a takedown on Shanghai, and it's at a time when when um, Lin Yu Tung is tran- transitioning, if you like, in his thinking towards favoring Beijing over Shanghai. But it's very mm. important. And I think it does express something that, of course, in 1949, when the great dust sheet was thrown over the city, nothing happened for a long time. And then we get going again in uh, kind of the late 90s. And people forget that Shanghai was really one of the last or the last big city to be allowed to reform and open up. Deng Xiaoping knew that Shanghai had to be last because otherwise it would swallow up too much else from the other coastal cities. So he made it last. Um, and then when it did get going, it went straight back and did gaudiness uh-huh. and uh, <laughs> vulgarity, right? With the uh, Oriental Pearl Tower. Now, if that has any fans, they'll be, they'll be arguing. But, you know, I, rem- uh-huh. I, I remember watching that going up. And then when they tapped it off, we just went, so is that meant to be retro? Is it meant what to look like something from the 1950s in mm. California, right? You know, but it wasn't. It was supposed to be modern in the future, and we were just like, "Wow, there is a vulgar modernity that has happened again." And we've seen it again and again and again with skyscrapers and buildings mm. in Shanghai, self-glorification, self-aggrandizement, and, and this is a long-running and deep tradition in Shanghai that is the other side of high pi. When you don't want to talk about, you know great novels by Lucian and Bargin and things, you've got to talk about some of this self-aggrandizing ag- architecture. Previously on the show, I cross, well, jokingly crossed swords with uh, Eric Abrahamson over what's better, Southern China or Northern China. I'm, I'm going to have to do the same here. I, I really like Art Deco, not for deep reasons. Um, maybe, maybe that's where we differ. I don't mind enjoying a superficial thing. But it's funny, it's reminding me of something that happened just a couple of days ago. Um, my dad came to visit me and my girlfriend and he brought us some gin and we were talking about, not that I have much to say about gins, it's kind of the point, but he said something like, oh, it's not like these stupid gin liqueurs, these ones that aren't really even real gin. And I took one out from our shelf. It was like a Edinburgh gin rhubarb and <laughs> something gin liqueur. And I'm like, yeah, you, you mean like this? It's, it's really nice. And he's like, yes, I suppose. It's really just an alcohol pop, though, isn't it? And then I thought, right, okay, I'm going to have to <laughs> change the topic of conversation here. I was just enjoying my nice gin liqueur. Look, you, 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 Ang, Angus, you're allowed to like what you like, mm. right? but you, you also have to accept that some people are going to see it as symbolism Trash. of the nouveau riche, of, mm. of a lack of sophistication. Um, you know, it, it, and, and that may also be certainly a sense of snobbery. And of course, you know, you may or may not think snobbery is a bad thing. I mean, I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. So, you know, th- there will be people that have different feelings about it. The point is, if you like the ephemeral, if you like the mass produced, if you like this style, that's fine. But you have to understand what the context of it is, whether it's in Palm Beach, Florida, whether it's in parts of London or Brussels, or whether it's in Shanghai. You have to understand why it occurred and what it represents a moment in an economic and political cycle that that it comes to the forefront. Mm, That's fair. Um, I suppose I'm a hypocrite. There are other plenty. There's plenty of things I'm a bit of a snob about. So I I would concede your point there for sure. Um, Before before we. I'm with you on the gin, by the way. (laughs) Well, then we'll never agree on that, I'm afraid. 
Right. So now that we're getting a bit silly, let's talk about um, humor. So um, I've read in a few places now, Lin Yutang brought a new word into Chinese, a, a transliteration of humor, uh, yo mo. So what do you think he was doing here? Or what was he trying to achieve bringing yo mo, this kind of, I, su- I mean, who, no one's going to say there was no comedy in, in Chinese culture, but he was trying to bring in this Western particular version of something that can make you laugh or smile, humor, yo mo. So what was he doing with it? And do you see any humor or yo mo in him to Shanghai? Well, I think uh, I'm, I'm not an expert on this. And there are se- several very good books on it. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, one by an academic at Hong Kong University whose name has escaped me that came out recently um, or a couple of years ago. Uh, I, I think that uh, it's to me, it's rather like the move among many of those Shanghai writers and, and others uh, towards the vernacular, t- towards speaking in terms of the way that ordinary people spoke to create right. the, mo- the modern novel in a modern language. Right? And I think that, that his use of humor is often like that. And as part of the takedown. Um, a Hymn to Shanghai was written as a riposte, as a reply to a rather pompous academic who had uh, done a very, very, uh, which I'm not going to go into um, because I'm, I'm not Christian and I'm certainly no theologian, a very long uh, sort of analogy of Shanghai with um Alexandria mm. uh, and and uh, a fight people dying outside the gates of heaven. It, it, it's very complicated. Lin Yu Tang as a as a Christian and a, you know someone who had, had been exposed to missionaries and so on and got this and and saw the pomposity of it. I, I would be uh, and he makes he makes fun of it. You know, um, saying that you know I must be right in thinking that Alexandria was situated somewhere in Egypt on the mouth of the Nile, as Shanghai is now situated on the dirty. Huang Pu. So there is some use to middle school teaching of geography after all. And that's basically the only good thing he says about that essay. And so when he goes into, um, as we'll hear, um, the hymn of Shanghai, he immediately starts saying, you know, oh, great and inscrutable city, thy city of hugging flesh, thrice praise to the city, (laughs) you know, um, uh, great and inscrutable art thou, you know, I mean, one thinketh of thy successful pian pian bellied merchants, you know, one thinketh of thy naked dancers, you know, and he does it in this kind of uh, biblical language, right, which mm. would be the thundering missionary from the pulpit, you know, who cannot be questioned, or the Bible, which you are just supposed to accept and not really question. And he uses that to great mock effect, um, you know, uh, quite an analysis of quite how he managed to translate that I, 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 is way beyond me. But it is um, that in itself is is funny if you know the context to what he's responding to. He is he is mocking the language mm. of 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 the cleric of the of of the missionary. And we know at the time, of course, that uh, that, that many of the missionaries in China, uh, both both Chinese that had converted and and the Western missionaries that went there, were very uh, what, what's the you know, thunder and brimstone type uh, missionaries. They often did speak right. like this, and and many uh, people who were who were educated or learnt their English from missionaries obviously learnt ob- sometimes learnt a very antiquated form of English that was that was almost uh, like this. Uh, the, the only thing I said once, I must say, and this was oh, years ago, I wrote a biography of an American that lived in Shanghai who started one of the first advertising agencies in China called Carl Crow. And he wrote a great book called 400 Million Customers. Really, really great person to read about the foreign experience in China. A kind of, a, a, you know, a great, uh, if you read Lin Yu Tang, I mean, Carl Crow is someone who's, who's worth reading as well. <clears throat> mm. Anyway, I got asked to go and talk about it. At one of these, uh, le- where, where you speak English to a Chinese audience so they can hear a na- native speakers <clears throat> by the American consulate in, uh, in Chengdu, which is no longer. And... Um, uh, I went up there and uh, it was all a bit weird because they thought I was American. So the idea was that you, you expose <laughs> Chinese people to American accents so that like it feels like America's winning because more, more Chinese would speak oh. English with an American accent. And of course, I, I have to be honest, you don't sound American. No, I, I turn up with my dulcet, you know, North London, <laughs> North London tones. And um, yeah. And anyway, we did this. And at the end of it, an old man who was very caricature of a, you know, Lao Bai Xing came up 
the mm. Chinese slippers, I mean, pretty shabby clothing. He obviously wasn't a man of any great uh, financial wealth or anything. But uh, and, and I would have I would have guessed maybe in his 80s. Um, he came up to me and he spoke the most amazing but completely outdated English in in a, in, oh, in, in, a, in an English accent far superior to mine. Uh, you know, like like he could have read the news on the BBC in in oh. 1937. <laughs> Right. I mean, you know, like not now when it's all regional accents. He could have he could have read the news back then when there was only one sort of accent. And he had his family had been Christian and um, right. he had gone to a missionary school and learned English this way and managed to maintain his English all through the vicissitudes and ups and downs of post-war China. Um, and there he was. I mean, I imagine he's no longer with us, but there he was in, in the 1990s in Chengdu, an old man. Uh, still had this English and, and going along every week to the American embassy just for the excuse to hear and occasionally to speak a little bit of English. And and, and the rest of the room was mm. sort of, you know, young people who were planning to go to uh, university in the West. And, and this old man that just sat at the back with the most perfect English. So, so there were people who spoke like this. And one of the reasons I know normally you look at translation from Chinese in, into English or whatever. It's interesting to look at it the other way because it tells you something about that generation of intellectuals around Lin Yu Tung. And so many of the people who were senior political, social, cultural, uh, creative leaders of, of nationalist China had had either a missionary education or had gone and studied in uh, America or to a lesser extent, the United Kingdom or France. Um, and really were uh, able to communicate, really were bilingual and able to communicate. So, mm -hmm. so this essay, this, this short piece, this poem, whatever we want to call it, was written for uh, the China Critic, which was completely produced by Chinese intellectuals in English. And mm. Lin Yu Tung had a column in it called The Little Critic, of which this was once a column. But these people were so well educated that they could translate themselves. They could go backwards and forwards. And we sort of forget that in those old days, you can read press conferences that many different uh, Chinese government figures had with Western journalists. And they just, they, they chatted. And at the end of it, they'd sing, you know, the old songs of Harvard University or Yale or Columbia or Oxford and Cambridge, you know? I mean, they had all studied in right. places like this. Whereas, of course, since then, we've become used to generations of politicians in China who have been, you know, if they were educated abroad, it was probably Russia, right? So, so a very different, right. a very different uh, tradition. Um, and so it's worth remembering that there was this, this much more, if you like, uh, sophisticated cosmopolitan element to, to, the, to the Chinese ruling class at that time. Mm -hmm. I, I've thought about this once or twice, I, and I know I've seen people talking about this in regards to um, Putin, but I was thinking like world leaders like Vladimir Putin and Xi Jinping especially, but other ones too. The thought in my head, and I'm sure in other people's heads too, is do these people have really good English? Because it would make an awful lot of sense if they did. But even if they did, would they ever let on publicly? Would they ever speak English into a microphone? It would, I guess today it would seem like a loss of face for someone if, if Xi Jinping spoke in his English to an international conference rather than going through a translator. It's, at least in my mind, it's pretty unthinkable. I can't picture it at all. It's fairly brave leaders that do it. I seem to remember Tony Blair once attempting a speech in, uh, in French that, that was rather lampooned by the French. But then, you know, you're fairly daring, mm. daring to order an, a cup of coffee in France, aren't you really, without being lampooned? <laughs> so it's, um, yeah, I, I think it, it, it's, and also everyone's so worried about saying the wrong thing and, right. and, and getting it very wrong um, that it probably wouldn't happen then. But then there was much more kind of, you know, off the record briefings. People often knew each other. I mean, many of these, right. many leaders, say, for instance, in, in nationalist China had studied at one university in America that took very many Chinese students on different courses was the University of Missouri. And, and many of them were all alumni. So they'd known each other and they had, and of course, you know, Chiang Kai-shek, not necessarily Chiang Kai-shek himself, but Chiang Kai-shek's uh, wife, of course, mm. Mei Ling Sung and the Sung family. I mean, you know, all very uh, uh, bilingual. It, it, it was just a different time in terms of, um, of, 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 the, of the bilingual nature of, uh, of, of leaders, I think, and cultural, cultural leaders as well. Um, as you were talking there about the kind of biblical stuff and also the sense of humor, a couple of things popped into my head. One was uh, the film Metropolis by Fritz Lang. Have, have you seen that one? Yes, and it's, it's funny you should ask me that because someone who's writing a PhD at the moment on something or other contacted me recently to say, did I have any evidence that Metropolis was ever shown at a cinema in Shanghai? And I managed to find a, 
an advert, I spend a lot of time looking at old newspapers, old Shanghai newspapers, English language and French and, and uh, Chinese, and, um, and, and found that it had been on at a cinema in the international concession and, and was actually reviewed as well. So yes, again, German expressionism. I mean, this, this is another thing that feeds into the whole high pie. I mean, port cities, this thing about Shanghai, it's a port city. So of course, it's always going to have greater exposure to foreigners and foreign ideas, right? I mean, port cities, mm. whether it be Marseille, Liverpool, New York, wherever, are always going to be more multicultural and often, if it's allowed, more multinational um, and have people from different backgrounds. And that is where ideas are going to come in and, and you know, and ideas mm-hmm. are going to go out from as well. It's going to be where everyone goes at some point. So many people go to Shanghai because they're coming in on ocean liners on round the world cruises or, or, or cruises to elsewhere. Um, so many people, Chinese people go to Shanghai because they are leaving to go and study abroad or live abroad or work abroad or something. So, so you know, these are great, tra- Shanghai is a great transmission belt of ideas. Mm. But of course, um, you know, as the North Koreans used to say about economic reform, um, you know, it's all very well opening a window, but the fly is getting. Um, <laughs> and so, and so there are, there's always going to, it's also why port cities are also, um, you know, great, sources of, of crime and sin and, and, and fun as well, I think. Mm. Yeah, the reason I was thinking about Metropolis was because, I, at least in my memory of the film, because it's been years since I watched it, it's, so we have a depiction of a city that's very modern uh, in like the capital M sense, but it's also like very kind of a, there's a lot of partying going on, morally questionable partying, de- debauchery you might call it, and the film itself, but also its hero, Critic, what's the word? Den- denouncing the the um, kind of hedonistic lifestyle, and just from my memory of it, I remember it seeming like a very sort of Christian, like I don't know what's the word, like a missionary spreading. I'm sure there's a scene where the the um, protagonist spreads his arms in the air in, in horror, witnessing yeah. you know, what we could just say is other people having fun. The, mis- the missionaries used to say that um, Shanghai was a thick slice of hell on a thin slice of heaven, um, mm. and. Um, yeah, I mean, I haven't seen the film for a long time, but I mean, that, that idea, of, but also of, of, of that being something to do with modernity, right? So if we look at, mm-hmm. um, particularly look at uh, literary journal covers and magazine covers of that time, the artists, there's a big influence of German expressionism. Um, and, and, and we see a lot of pictures of, of dance halls, people with monocles in there, you know, almost always taken, inspired often by uh, German expressionist pictures, uh, paintings and, and drawings. And I think, uh, you know, that notion of the new, the modern, whether it be uh, automobiles, I mean, we'll come on later perhaps to talk about, about books about Shanghai, but if you read Andre Malraux's uh, mm. Man's Fate, uh, which I think is, is, is a great book about Shanghai, it, you know, at the very, in the very first few pages, what does he have? He has, and it's 1927, he has, uh, set in 1927, he has has um, uh, uh, traffic jams, car hooters, uh, phonograph records being played, um, electric lights, just noise, right? Uh, mm. Noise, light, neon, which Shanghai was known for, you know, the lighting up of the nighttime space, restaurants that are open all night. You know, I've written in City of Devils about the introduction of slot machines. And we'll talk here perhaps about, you know, Mm. greyhound racing, which is much, much more, I don't want to criticize anyone who's written about it later, much, much more interesting than the the bloody horse racing, right? Horse racing was for, for, for the elites and it was old school. Where everyone could get together was the greyhound racing. And, and, and that's true in every country, actually, as opposed to horse racing. And, and really, mm. you know, it's also a form of modernity. It's done under floodlights with the electric rabbit racing around in front of it and, and totalizer betting as well, which requires a certain level of technology to organize. So, you know, all of, all of this, I think, is, um, is being reflected in the art and, and the work that's coming out of it. And as you say, it, it, the same thing is happening in uh, Weimar Germany, as it is to an extent in in London mm. and Paris, the city of light, and London where Piccadilly, where everything is going on, and New York, of course. So, so all of these and and the city Shanghai is often compared to by some as Chicago. So, it, it, all of that is um, is going on at that time, and and is again influencing Lin Yu Tung. And in this particularly, it's he's not so sure it's a good idea. Right. But there's other times when he thinks it's a brilliant idea, right? So he's he's going back <laughs> like we all do. He's going backwards and forwards. Do I love the internet? Do I hate the internet? Do I love social media? Do I hate social media? You know that. Mm. Well, um, 
speaking of being in a sort of middle position, when it comes to greyhound racing and horse racing, I'm, I'm pleased to be a very detached Lin Yutang. We, we don't have to disagree over that like we do about Jin and uh, Art Deco. Um, another thing I was going to ask you about just before we get on to him uh, to Shanghai itself, or maybe not even ask you about, just comment on. Um, it's another one of those little uh, articles that is up on the uh, China Heritage Quarterly website, which I think is an amazing example of uh, how Lin Yutang would try and get a laugh whilst also talking about uh, uh, issues of the times is a little piece called do bed bugs exist exist in china have you read that one uh no i don't think i have i think i read his one about why there's no seagulls on the huangpu um this one i'll try and summarize it you can read listeners and anyone I'll, I'll link to it in the show notes you can read this one in a few minutes and um, so basically he starts with uh, describing a scene where a group of people could be anywhere in the world but just for our purposes it's china he says um <clears throat> a bed bug crawls out from a sofa and uh, one of the hosts, not wishing, not wishing to um, let anyone see it, sits on it. And he kind of uses the bed bug as a metaphor for like any embarrassing flaw in a country. So t- the article title, Do Bed Bugs Exist in China? is basically, do problems exist in China? And then yeah. he has, I think, it's like a modern listicle article. It's like eight different people's responses to the question. Um, so there's like the uh, KMT government who say... Um, Anyone who talks about uh, bedbugs existing in China is not patriotic and should be sent to jail. Uh, and then there's the, uh, I think it's the North Shanghai, North, uh, there's one, one of the foreign run newspapers, their response is... Right. Um, North China Daily News. Something like that, yeah. Their response is, bedbugs exist in China, but we don't have them in England. We demand extra ter- ter- uh, territoriality. <laughs> <laughs> and... The second to last one, it's Dr. Hu Shu, who, if I understand rightly, was one of uh, Lin Yutang's kind of um, a, a like-minded intellect, fellow intellectual. And Hu Shu gives like the liberal, the sensible liberal cosmopolitan position, which is like, well, if bed bugs exist in any country, be it China, Japan, Germany, or England, we should sort them out and find out if there are more. And that's your kind of boring straight answer at the end. And then the last one, it's... Um, it's Lin Yutang himself. And he says, oh, a bed bug. How excellent. I'll use this to make my point and get a laugh or two. And then the final line is one of Lin Yutang's guests saying, Lin Yutang, you disgusting man. What are you What are you talking about? And that's the end of it. And I think if, if you want like a good, maybe not an intro to his writing, because it's in a listicle, not essay format, but um, his sense of humor and his way of looking at things is really embedded in that art little do bed bugs exist joke article, I think. But yeah, um, let's go on to the uh, him to Shanghai itself. Now, in, in the list of questions I sent you, it says, let's hop in our spaceship and look at the novel itself. That's an accident. That's because I adapted this for the questions I'm going to do about um, Cat Country, which really is a story about going to another planet. But just ignore the spaceship part and let's look at him to Shanghai. I was wondering, would you like to read this with me um, line by line, taking it turn about? Yeah, there's definitely some, I mean, I think people will get the, it's not very long, and I think people will get the idea of it, but it might be nice to do some of the examples he uses have maybe been a bit lost to history, I think. Mm, Right, so we can kind of give our um, spark notes as we go through. Here we go. Take a breath. Shanghai is terrible, very Mm -hmm. terrible. Shanghai is terrible in her strange mixture of Eastern and Western vulgarity, in her superficial refinements and in her naked and unmasked worship of Mammon, in her emptiness, commonness and bad taste. She is terrible in her denaturalized women, denaturalized coolies, devitalized newspapers, decapitalized banks and denationalized creatures. She is terrible in her greatness as well as her weakness terrible in her perversities and inanities, terrible in her joys and follies and in her tears, bitterness and degradation, terrible in her vast immutable stone edifices that rear their head high on the bund and in the abject huts of creatures subsisting on their discoveries from refuse cans. In fact, one might sing a hymn to the great terrible city in the following fashion. O great and inscrutable city, thrice praise to thy greatness and to thy inscrutability. Thrice praise to the city renowned for her copper odour and her fat, oily bankers with green-tinted skins and sticky fingers. To thy city of hugging flesh and dancing flesh, of flat-chested ladies fed on ginseng soup and dove's nest congee, and still looking anemic and weary of life in spite of their ginseng soup and dove's nest congee. wonder, do you know what ginseng soup is? I'm not familiar with yes, that Yes, it's, it's simply uh, ginseng. Ah, right. Okay. 
<laughs> so obvious I didn't see it. Let's keep going. To the city of eating flesh and sleeping flesh, of ladies with bamboo shoot feet and willow waists, rouged faces and yellow teeth, cackling ha 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 like monkeys from their cradles to their graves. To the city of running flesh and kowtowing flesh, of hotel boys with shining slippery heads and slipperier manners, who minister to the fat, oily bankers with green-tinted skins and sticky fingers, and to hugging flesh and dancing flesh with rouged cheeks and yellow teeth. Great and inscrutable art thou. In the still hours of the night, one conjureth up a picture on thy monstrosities. In the muddy stream of human traffic on Nanking Road, muddier than the muddy fish of the muddy Huangpu, one thinketh of thy greatness also. One thinketh of thy successful Pien Pien bellied merchants and forgetteth whether they are Italian, French, Russian, English, or Chinese. And we should stop here and say, what, for people who don't know, what's Pien Pien? Pien Pien to me is uh, the kind of, uh, what do you call uh, the, the the way that people with a large belly sort of walk with it rather protruding and proud as they walk along with it. Mm, it seems like it's kind of onomatopoeic, kind of. Uh, sounds like what it means. Anyway, yeah. let, let's keep going. One think of, of thy masseuses, naked dancer, Carlo Garcias, and thy Fucho Road sing-song houses. So let's pause here. Is Fucho Road particularly notorious at this time? Well, yes. Uh, uh, Fucho Lu, <laughs> Fucho Road, which is now, of course, a, a mostly a, a street of bookshops, and, and was then as well, as well as restaurants. But the little alleyways off of uh, the Lilong, off of um, Fujo Road, were very well known for being houses of prostitution, brothels. And so people went there. Now, the reference to Carlos Garcia is a very interesting one, because if you've read my book, City of Devils, you'll know that Carlos Garcia is, uh, is mentioned in there. Now, Carlos Garcia was a Mexican who came to Shanghai and in the 1920s made an awful lot of money running tequila from his own family all the way uh, from Mexico to Shanghai. And in Shanghai, he put it in uh, barrels marked pig's bristles. A major export between Shanghai and America in the 1920s mm. was pig's bristles, which mm. made toothbrushes. They were the, the sort of... Oh, no. <laughs> those were toothbrushes, yeah. Um, and, and not something a customs man would want to look too closely at until they were properly cleaned and, and used. And he would fill that with tequila and ship it from Shanghai to the West Coast of America. So a massive round trip, but because of the profits in prohibition, he made an awful lot of money. Money he invested in two things. Well, money he invested in a casino called uh, The Wheel, which was, uh, I forget what road it was on, but it was very successful until the police busted it, largely because other casino operators were angry about it. And he ended yeah. up doing a year in Ward Road Jail, which is the old jail in Tilan Chow, which shut a couple of years ago, a few years ago. Right. He came out, determined to get his revenge on various British interests that, uh, that um, he felt had uh, sort of um, informed on him to the police. He uh, looked at what they were doing, which was running dog racing tracks, one called Luna Park and another one out in Yangpu. And he decided to build what became the Canidrome in, uh, in French town, uh, which was an enormous and the most modern building, an enormous nightclub, which if you'll know from City of Devils is where Joe Farron, one of the one of the stars of that, a choreographer and dancer, brought Buck Clayton and his Harlem Gentlemen, one of the big, one of the first big American jazz bands to come to Shanghai. And next to it was the stadium, which was there until the early 2000s um, on, on Mao Ming. Those who remember when Mao Ming Road was a, a little bar strip at the sort of French town end of Mao Ming Road. We'll remember that if you drank there late enough, you could wander in to the flower market in the morning. And the flower market was in the old stands of the Canidro. It's all gone now. Mm -hmm. It's a rather, it's a sort of a musical venue and a big sort of soulless landscaped park. Um, look at pictures online. Absolutely incredible. Very modern art deco. Um, and of course it ran greyhound racing, but also was a big centre for other I would argue more than horse racing, more, more proletarian, all encompassing, i.e. Chinese foreigners, anyone could go boxing, uh, football, but, well, which I mean soccer, uh, and mostly um, dog racing, which took place in the evenings. And just across the road was the Hialai front on uh, for obviously the Basque sport of Hialai, which was which was big at the time. And all of that was run by Carlos uh, Garcia. So that's why he gets a particular mention. So all that in just two words, making up a name. Amazing. Do you want to keep us going with the next verse? Of thy retired Tao Tai and Tufai and magistrates and generals with tortoise shell spectacles 
and roof-shaped moustaches, trying to court sing-song girls with their loot and find their love repulsed and their sexual hunger unappeased after months of courtship. So help me out here. What's a Tao Tai and what's so, a Tu Fei? A Tao Tai is essentially a, a Tao Tai or a local governor, a politician, invariably right. considered by Lin Yutang to be corrupt. And often when they finished being the governor of an area of Jiangsu and, and robbing it of as much tax money as they could, they retired and bought nice houses in Shanghai. Mm. A Tufei is uh, another word for a bandit or, or sort of minor warlord robber. And of course, what he's doing is um, linking the idea of a corrupt politician and an outright bandit. Right. right. So he's linking the two together and magistrates and generals. So all of these people are, are corrupt. Um, he does mm. mention tortoise shell spectacles. You can't watch a, a film or a TV series about old Shanghai without seeing lots of tortoise shell spectacles. <laughs> right. Um, and roof-shaped uh, moustaches, by which he means this uh, kind of Chinese eaved uh, roof, which you'll see as well. Sing-song girls, sing -song girls are not technically prostitutes, of course. They're, they're more sort of courtesans, entertainment uh, girls. Um, although everyone was always trying to get them to move from being a sing-song girl to being their, a prostitute or their mistress, courtesan, uh, concubine, whatever you want to say. Um, and so there was always, there's always lots of jokes in, in Chinese literature at the time. I'm sure he talks about books where it's mentioned and short stories about people pursuing sing-song girls, spending vast amounts of money which goes not really to the girl, but to the Sing Song house, many of which were on Fu Chao or Fu Zhou Lu, Fu Chao Road, um, and, and, and never kind of, uh, well, never getting to the ultimate prize, or as we might say, being too common English, uh, British chaps, sorry, um, you know, not getting their leg over. Mm. Um, so so that, 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 again, is, is quite humorous and a, and a sort of a, a funny take on um, a certain type of thing in Shanghai that was a running gag, the sort of provincial merchant that goes to a sing-song house, falls in love with a lovely girl, but spends lots and lots of money, but is never quite able to consummate the relationship. Right. Okay, I'm going to keep us going. Mm. Of the idiotic and half-witted sons of these retired Tao Tai and generals who helped to rid them of their ill-begotten gains and sin-smelling wealth. Well, I should mention there, of course, that the the idea that the, uh, the the sons and daughters of the rich and powerful, um, you know, are are fairly useless and just go racing around the streets in Ferraris and everything has its historic uh, mm. <laughs> counterpart. Right. That's uh, what's the word we of, use these days? Uh, fu ar dai. Uh, uh, fu ar dai. Yeah. Of thy wealthy degenerate opium smokers who parade the streets in Packard eights, guarded by robust, well-fed, uniformed Russians. Now that, of course, sorry, that refers to, of course, uh, the practice of opium smoking, which is still going mm. on. Packard eights are American cars, big American cars that were much favoured by wealthy merchants. And and many of the Russian emigres, former czarist military officers, were hired on as uh, as bodyguards by many Chinese uh, businessmen and politicians. Why? Well, two reasons, really. One, it was a sort of show-off thing. Look at me with my big white guys that, that, that protect me. And two, because it was felt that their allegiance would be to whoever paid them rather than to maybe someone else who came from the district they came from or their clan or something who might be able to persuade them to turn around and assassinate their, uh, their employer. Yeah, I was really curious about the Russians, but yeah, that makes a lot of sense now that you've explained it. Anyway, let me let me keep things going. Of the of thy Wangpu daily receiving its quota of would be suicides, of thy dancing girls and heartbroken young men mingling with the muddy Huangpu fish. Oh well, I would like to mention here that in the last issue of the Shanghai Literary Review, I wrote a piece called um, "Shanghai's Suicide Hotels," which is really about just a very high rate of suicide in Shanghai. Shanghai was a was a uber capitalist society. There was no safety net, no no unemployment benefit, no national health service, nothing like that. Um, if you failed financially or in terms of your health or old age, uh, there really was no one to stop you. And so, suicide among um, both Chinese and foreigners was was extremely um, common. And very interestingly, um, one of the major ways that the Chinese, uh, the, the foreigners used to shoot themselves invariably or jump out of windows. The uh, Chinese didn't like either of those things, but they did uh, have a tendency to jump into the Huangpu. The papers are just full of people jumping into the Huangpu. And this was largely attributed to the fact that at that time, it was felt that many Chinese couldn't swim. So it was, it was a much it was it was a bit of a quicker death than if you suddenly changed your mind and started struggling and, and swimming. So, so, but Shanghai was always, and this is part of, of, of Shanghai, that, you know, if you failed, you really failed. And often for many people, suicide was the only way they saw of, um, of, of ending that situation. Mm. Oh, that's 
sad. So let's keep going. Oh, sorry, it's your turn, isn't it? Yes. Of thy majestic tables, where vulgarity gathers to meet vulgarity and see how vulgarity dresses. Well, this goes back to the notion of vulgarity that I was talking about before, which I mm. think is really important in Lin Yu Tung's analysis of Shanghai. The majestic was at the time when he wrote this at the late 1920s, the best hotel in Shanghai. This is before Sir Victor Sassoon built the Cafe Hotel. It was owned by the Kadori family who owned the Peninsula Hotel Group, another Baghdadi Jewish family who had become very wealthy in Shanghai. Um, and it had regular uh, tea dances um, where uh, Chinese and, and foreigners could go to. Um, actually, by the time that this the Majestic was knocked down in around late 1929, 1930. So when this version came out in China, Chinese, that hotel had already gone, but but everyone would have remembered it. It was such a landmark. Mm, right. That's why it's majestic with a big M. Mm. It's me next, isn't it? Yes. Of thy dog races where white women in V-shaped evening dresses mingle merrily and run shoulders with yellow shop apprentices and grey dogs and pink-eyed rabbits. Is there anything to say here? Oh, I think this is really important. Um, I just recently read James Carter, the sinologist uh, from America, did a book on the Shanghai Race Club. And it's a really, really interesting book. But in my view, it rather downplays the importance of greyhound racing, because as I said, it was much more egalitarian, much more proletarian. Everybody went to the dog races. Not everybody could go to the horse races. And it didn't appeal to everybody. Also, the horse races were often during the day when many of us had to go to work. Dog racing was often in the evenings. There were daytime dog racing. It was often in the evenings under floodlights. So that's why we have, you know, white women in their evening dresses who are probably going to the Canidrome ballroom, at Carlos Garcia's Canidrome dog racing truck. And they are there with yellow shop apprentices, by which he means, of course, um, Chinese Chinese people. It would be a very egalitarian crowd. If you've ever been to Happy Valley in Hong Kong, you'll know it's a very egalitarian crowd that go to, to, to those horse races, which are more akin to the old Shanghai dog races. Grey dogs and, of course, the pink-eyed rabbits that, that run ahead for the dogs to chase. So it's very important to bring dog racing back as this great egalitarian leveller in Shanghai. That's really where all Shanghai gathered, not the jockey club, but at the actual um, dog racing track. Right. Uh, you're next. Of thy nouveau riche, lost and giddy in the whirlpool of parties and rides, millionaires who order hotel boys about like lieutenant colonels and eat their soup with their knives. Mm. Um, what's up with the eating their soup with their knives line? What's that about? Well, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I just think that it, he's maybe talking there about um, these generals and, and soldiers that he said sort of, you know, make lots of money, the corrupt money, and then come mm. and live in Shanghai. Um, just sort of ending up in western style restaurants and not quite sure how to do it he's rather mocking them i think for their for their kind of vulgarity right so the the nouveau riche he's talking about here are the the chinese nouveau riche maybe we'll yes see. i think he's talking about the chinese nouveau riche and this is again why you know you have to understand that lin yu tang is a snob <laughs> as well as anything now whether you think again as i said earlier if you think a snob is a bad thing then you're probably not going to like lin yu tang if you think that you know it's kind of funny, uh, you know, uh, to mock these people, then, um, then then you won't have so much of a problem with it. But but mm. that's certainly what he's doing. And he's looking at, I think if you'd asked Lin Yu Tang, he would have probably looked at the idea of, well, you know, there's a, the vulgarity comes from the vulgar way they made their money by stealing it. Right. Yeah. I think even if you don't like snobs, Lin Yu Tang might have enough charm in his writing to, to win you over. But um, let, let's keep going with the, the story here, or the, the piece. Of thy nouveau moderns, intoxicated by a few phrases of Yang Ching Pan Pigeon, and never letting an opportunity slip for saying many thanks and excuse me to you. So what exactly is going on here in this, in this section? Oh, well, he's talking here about the, the, the modern ones, the, those Chinese that have embraced or Western culture, and like to throw in uh, English phrases, in English mannerisms into their into their language. And this is also the sort of people who start to attend uh, the, the tea balls at the Majestic, for instance, and, and, and later on dancing to the jazz bands and, and wearing Western suits and Western clothes and so on. He's really talking about those. Um, Yang Ching Pang, or Yang Jingbang uh, Pigeon, is, is, is slightly lost on us now because the Yang Jingbang Creek, which used to run, if you know Shanghai, you'll know... Um, uh, around where the Great World Amusement Center is, uh, just along from there, um, obviously that's uh, uh, Shizanglu, where the YMCA is, through the middle there, sort of running parallel to the Yan'an Expressway from from the um, Bund, used to be 
the Yangjingbang Creek, which wasn't as big as Suzhou Creek, but, but was a major waterway. And there was a whole community that lived around it that I do believe had its own, I'm not going to say dialect exactly, but more sort of Argo mm. um, that, that it spoke. And in fact, everyone knows, of course, the Green Gang and the Red Gang, the two, the two great criminal gangs of, of Shanghai, Du Yue Xiong's uh, Green Gang and uh, Wang Jingrong's pockmarked Huang's uh, Red Gang, Big Ear Du's mm. Green Gang. Uh, there was originally a third gang called the Blue Gang that was centered around uh, the Yang Jingbang. But the Yang Jingbang Creek was, was sort of covered over around the time of the First World War. Um, so again, he's referring back to something, you know, it's almost, uh, he's referring back to almost, I don't know, I imagine if you were, to, in, in an English context, if you were to sort of sort of refer back to the sort of the slanginess of the sort of Cray Twins era London or something right. like that, do you know what I mean? He's, it's something everyone knows, but, mm. but, it, but it's kind of disappeared under the modernity of Shanghai. That's interesting that even at the time he's writing, this thing's already literally been concreted over but it's still existent as a, you know, entry in the local uh, vernacular or vocabulary. It's really interesting. Uh, I think it's your turn to do the next verse. Of thy girl students perched astride their baggage on the rickshaws with rolled socks and hats on which perch robin red breasts and chrysanthemums of different colours. Okay, so listeners won't see this, but robin red breasts is capitalised. Is, is there something I'm missing here? I don't know. Maybe I'm missing it too. I'm just assuming that he's talking about when people were moving around or come to college, they throw all their baggage onto the chair of the rickshaw and then sit on top of it. Um, and this is the kind of clothing they're wearing, but with adornments, you know, um, a brooch of a robin redbreast or a chrysanthemum. I'm, I'm assuming that's what he's talking about. And again, mm. the modernity of having adornment on your clothing, rolled socks and hats, all of this is the sort of modernity of school uniform, of the Western mm. style school uniform and of, of jewellery and, and fashion. Right. Uh, okay, my turn. Of thy haughty, ungentlemanly foreigners, so haughty and ungentlemanly that one knows where they belong in their own countries, men with a moderate head, but stiff boots and strong calf muscles. Men who give large-sized tips and complain of exorbitant prices, who feel legitimately aggrieved and insulted when people fail to understand their native land. Okay, let's pause here. Th these last two verses. So the foreigner who gets mad when no one speaks English, uh, that's definitely a genre of la wai that uh, I've met a few times in Shanghai, let's say. But th the verse that comes before that about like specifying their boots and their calf muscles and the fact they're haughty, I'm not so sure if that's still a kind of foreigner you can meet in China. Do you know what's going on there? I, I think, I mean, I think he's referring, as, as did other Chinese at the time, to somewhat of the sort of, you know, the... I mean, it almost goes back to the original descriptions of, 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 of the foreigners that you read around the time of the Canton trade and, and, and much earlier. And, and I think it's just more the, the sort of size and the stridency and the way they hold themselves and they sort of, you know, move, uh, move around what I guess we'd now call sort of uh, white privilege, you know, mm. just, just sort of walking in and out of rooms, answering to no one, feeling not needing any encouragement, never feeling they might be doing the wrong thing, you know. And I think a lot of us who, who don't come perhaps from a, from a higher social world standing um you know when we first go to restaurants we never quite know what knife and fork to use we never quite know how to pour tea or you know i mean i hate it when anyone gives me a wine list mm. <laughs> you know that kind of thing right and i think there are other people and obviously many white people of all backgrounds but you know even today you'll get certain people who just have the ability to do that the sort of you know boris johnson ability to just yeah. walk up and just fluff it totally and you know <laughs> think they've pulled it off and no one can tell them any difference so yeah i have met that kind of foreigner as well but mm. i've met them in my own country more regularly than china i so, well speaking of which um so i said i told you before we started recording i'm, I'm staying in fife well i'm living with my girlfriend who is a recently completed phd student at st andrews so uh, scotland's english uh, treaty port and <laughs> When you take a trip to St Andrews, which we're doing occasionally before lockdown, you would hear the conversations of some of these uh, these people, and uh, almost always guys. And even if they were like they look like eighteen or nineteen, like once or twice, we in fact once we literally, as we sat down, we saw a couple of pretty young lads standing up, and like their way of saying goodbye was shaking hands and saying, eh, "Looking forward to a good Brexit." Then, and it's like, damn, <laughs> where have I where have I gone? I'm only ten miles from Dundee. 
I mean, I, I, should, I, I did a project last year for Audible, the, on, the online uh, people, online books people. It was, was, was an Audible original called Murders of Old China. And it went back and it looked at various murder cases from this period. Mm. Um, and, and there were usually some racial component to it. The, you know, that Chinese was the major witness or Chinese was the victim or, or, or the accused or whatever. And it was interesting how many times, you know, uh, some foreigner or another had taken it upon himself to, to beat up a, a rickshaw person. Mm -hmm. And again, that kind of, you know, they would, they would often, the idea that they would tip largely, but then, um, then argue the, the toss about the actual fare is a good one. The Chinese used to be very funny. And if they thought a foreigner was fat, which they mostly thought most foreign men were fat, they would try and charge them more, right? Because obviously <laughs> it's a heavier load if you're a rickshaw puller. And, um, and uh, you know, people would argue for half an hour about 10 cents, right? But then mm. tip a dollar. I mean, that was a sort of a, yeah, that was a regular sort of back and forth. Okay. And, and, a, and a multiple everyday interaction between, rickshaws are always very interesting because it's one of the biggest multiple, interactions between foreigners and Chinese that just went on thousands of times a day in Shanghai. Mm, right. We could, I'm sure we could talk about rickshaws um, for another hour, yes. but let, let's, let's keep it moving. Um, There's a whole book about those that you can get on the show at some point. Mm, yes. You know, I'll show sure again. Lao yeah, yeah. yeah. That he's, okay. he's coming up. You're... Yes. Okay, my turn, my turn. Um, one thinketh and wondereth of all these things and faileth to comprehend their whence or their whither. O oh, thou city that surpasseth our understanding, how impressive are thy emptiness, thy commonness, and thy bad taste. Thou city of retired brigands, officials, and generals, and cheats, infested with brigands, and officials, and generals, and cheats, who have not yet made their fortunes. O oh, thou the safest place in China to live in, where even thy beggars are dishonest. Uh, that's the end. And of course, I mean, we should also say that, you know, beggars in Shanghai and all of China having their own guilds, right? Their own mm. unions and, and it being a very regulated and, and a sort of seemingly honest trade, right? But in Shanghai, even the beggars are dishonest. So I think that's a sort of a, that, that was sort of one of those things that would probably, uh, you know, I don't know, like, uh, like a joke about, you know, oh, I got in a London taxi the other day and I didn't get a racist stream of pro-Brexit <laughs> nonsense. It's just like, no, that never happens, right? You know? So it's kind of, um, he, he gets in there with a little in-joke at the end. And I think anyone reading this at the time, where, when he first wrote it, of course, but certainly when he translated it again, uh, translated it into Chinese, would have got all of these references and, and, and all of these in-jokes. Although I believe it's um, actually the bits that we were talking about, about the strident foreigners, he actually took out in the Chinese one because the situation had slightly changed again and so when he wrote this his feelings were more antagonistic towards Shanghai than when he translated it after the 1932 Japanese attack on Shanghai when he was feeling that the settlement the foreign concessions had stood up and, and resisted that attack and Shanghai mm. was persevering against perhaps if you like a common enemy. Right. So I, that was going to be my next question about uh, the changing times and the differences in the translation. So your, your, your way of analyzing that is that you think he's feeling a little bit more solidarity or, I don't know, just less negative feelings towards all the various foreigners. Is that, is that well, I, you an know, accurate I, characterization? Lin Yutang has an argument with treaty ports, with extraterritoriality, with the way that many uh, uh, you know, foreigners will have strout, strout, strided around with their white privilege and, and, and so on. He would have uh, worried about the, the corruption uh, among um, Chinese military leaders and politicians and so on. Um, however, once the attack with Japan starts to happen, we start to see a kind of need for a common front, both within the Chinese, between a nationalist and communist, you know, stopping their own internal fighting to, to concentrate on the fight against Japan. And that we can come back to all these issues afterwards. But if we don't defeat Japan, then it's all a moot point. Right. So, so this has to be uh, this has to be done first, um, and I think that that's uh, that's kind of interesting. One thing that you should note is Lin Yutang would have taken the uh, Japanese attack in 1932 on Shanghai very, very personally. Um, the China Critic, which of course this was originally, and so much of his work was originally published in, and where he had a column called the Little Critic and where he was very involved with the directors and the shareholders and the other editors and writers at, of different 
publications of the commercial press, the largest uh, press in Shanghai that had made a lot of money doing school textbooks and had then used that money to set up many, many literary journals and was publishing all sorts of interesting people, classics as well as new vernacular writing, translations, all of that going on through the commercial press. The commercial press building took a direct hit from a Japanese shell in 1932 and burned to the ground, including its entire library of 500,000, half a million books, which included irreplaceable classic texts in very, very early editions. It was all destroyed by um, a firebomb that, that, that just, just gutted the building completely. So the entire infrastructure of the China critic, the commercial press, was basically wiped out by, bomb, by Japanese bombing in 1932. So he had felt very, very personally, um, you know, the tragedy of the Japanese attack on Shanghai in 1932. Right. So for all his kind of staying aloof and not strongly taking a side, Here's here's an instance where he he really feels that he is kind of involved and has to take a side. Yes, and, and it, it really ramps up his his feelings. Of course, he leaves China in 1936 to go to America, and when he's there, he spends so much of his time trying to explain the Chinese struggle, the Chinese cause to America through those um, two novels, which of course I'm going to forget the names of. Um, he forgets uh, the. Uh, One's very good. Moment in Peking? So good. Yeah, Moment in Peking, which is a very good kind of, um, you know, family saga that takes us up to 1937. And it's a, a peon to uh, Peking as well. Mm. And then the other one that he wrote, um, which came just after it, uh, which I'm going to forget now as well. Oh, <laughs> Leaf in a Storm. Leaf yes. in a Storm. Yes. Yeah. Which he wrote in 1941 and, and published. And that, that's not, it, it's a slightly more formulaic book, but again, it's about the struggle of China from 1937. And of course, you know, reinforcing to a Western audience in a genre that they like, the kind of family saga, the, the idea of generations all living together. I mean, that's a very popular one in, in, in all sorts of, you know, in all national literatures. And he's telling that story. And of course, uh, but telling the story of China's struggle, uh, the struggle of an allied nation, of course, starting from really, if you like, you know, the summer of 1937 and the occupations of Tianjin and Beijing and, of course, the bombing of Shanghai and then moving on to the roll up the Yangtze, the terrible rape of Nanjing um, several months afterwards. And, of course, eventually the, the removal of the Chinese government to Chongqing and then, you know, total all out war um, in 1937. You know, I mean, two years before, just just two years before uh, Britain goes to war um, in Europe. And of course, you know, several years before December 1941, um, America goes to war with Japan. So, you know, there's that whole period when he is very much agitating, as are many Chinese uh, around the world, um, you know, support for the Chinese calls against uh, Japan, uh, which, which, which worked reasonably well, both in the UK and, and the US and elsewhere. Um, and those novels were, were part of that, his telling of those stories, just a, you know, good family saga novels that, that, that people go and borrow from their library or buy in their local bookshop and giving them a good strength. And I think this partly came as well from his friendship with Pearl Buck, um, mm. who, of course, has always written more in that genre. And so he moves more into that genre, both explaining the nation, the importance of living, the wisdom of Confucius. Um, the, these are books that he writes. He then writes another book during the war about the wisdom of China and India, looking at the transition of Buddhism from India to China and so on. Vigil of a Nation, which is about, you know, the ability to hold out throughout all of this. You know, he, 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 he is publishing uh, many, of, many of these things. He then he, he writes other things after the war, some novelettes. He starts uh, retelling classic stories for a Western audience. He, he really brings uh, Lao Shu to the forefront of Western readers' attention as well, with a with a sort of biography and a book about him. Um, writing about all sorts of all sorts of things, um, and always maintaining that liberal uh, liberal cosmopolitan uh, feel. You know, he writes about Chinese ideas of art as opposed to Western ideas of art. He he writes about uh, he, he writes a great book called The Pleasures of a Nonconformist, which again shows his liberal cosmopolitan mm. cosmopolitan ways. Um, and of course he can have no truck really with China after 1949 and he, he ends up in uh, Taiwan. Yeah. Uh, I think I forgot to mention when we were talking about either his his views or his humor, uh, some of the stuff I 
that he's written, which I've read, which I've liked the most, are his ideas of the old rogue and the scamp. I think the idea of the old rogue kind of morphed into the idea of the scamp. He, if I think it, when he's talking about the old rogue, he first tries to say it's like a trait of the kind of Chinese national character. People have criticized that and said, well, actually, no, he's more just talking about himself. And then in, I think in uh, The Art of Living, he's mostly, when he gets to that point, he says, he talks about the scamp instead, but something the kind of person who's kind of detached is a little bit of a trickster or a, a jokester and you know is gets up to yeah. gets up to mischief sounds a bit trivial but someone who's yeah um you're probably not going to see leading the revolution because that's not a very scampish thing to do i don't know if i'm a scamp it's, but it really speaks to me i think it's worth saying as well that you know some people not so much did but certainly did later uh, after his death see him as somewhat uh, ephemeral somewhat on the margins of things you know, they, they sort of slightly mocked his dandy, mm. dandy sort of way of dressing. You know, he dressed very well. There's lots of pictures of him with ornate teacups and things like that. If you go to his house in Taiwan, Taipei, which was his last house, it's very beautiful furniture there. His, his bookshelves are, are fantastic. He he was a man who, who knew how to live well. He had style and taste. And I think it was a style and taste that you might associate more with... Um, with uh, I don't know if, you, if you've read the the Dance to the Music of Time by Anthony Pohl or, or something like that. It's more of a classic, uh, lo- long long lasting timelessness of sort of inherent taste that that some people have. Um, as again, as opposed to the vulgarity of Art Deco or the vulgarity of Art Nouveau, the vulgarity of something that's here today and gone tomorrow. Mm. There's a, there's a timelessness to his taste, but he manages to if you go to his house in Taipei, you can see this incorporate wonderful uh, pieces of Western furniture with wonderful examples of traditional Chinese furniture, lacquerware, blackwood furniture, as well as good, you know, Western sofas, which, which many people did at the time, because let's face it, a Western sofa is a lot more comfy than, than many Chinese chairs, but, but you need to, you know, so he, he managed to do that very, very well. And I think he, was, he thought a lot about, uh, in this way, he's quite contemporary in, in a sense that he thought a lot about what he ate, he thought a lot about what he drank, he thought a lot about how he approached people and spoke to people and and, you know, and I, and I think all of that sometimes was very easy to mock, particularly in the sort of 1950s and 60s when mainland China, you know, purposefully introduced a certain coarseness in, into the language and into, into the manners such as they were. Um, you know, he was totally at odds. His tradition was totally at odds to that. Mm-hmm. A couple more questions about him to Shanghai before we get on to the technical and the um, extra sort of questions. So a thing I noticed about um, him to Shanghai is it f- just feels very busy to be reading it. And the way the, the the short sort of verses are broken up almost seemed to me like sort of a street by street or alley by alley view of the city. Like I was kind of picturing someone standing up on a rooftop looking down. Um, we did kind of already analyze the poem line by line. So we've already sort of done that kind of top-down observation of the hustle and bustle. Um, so I just want to ask you instead, have you got any favorite lines or verses in Him to Shanghai, just just on a personal level or uh, your cup of tea? Well, I, li- I like very much his... Uh his references to when he refers to the v-necked western women in evening gowns with the, with the, with the shot clerks at the horse racing i mean at the dog racing sorry i mean that's very much i mean if you read a lot of my work that's what i'm trying to sort of recreate that that atmosphere i, I think what's really important is we're only really just starting to understand how much writers like lin yutang lao she lu shen fit into global modernism mm. uh, i published a book several years ago in the royal asiatic Society China series by Anne Wichard of Westminster University on Lao Shu's time in London, and she shows that you know he was reading Joyce and 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 other modernist writers, right? And that's really interesting. I don't we don't know exactly who Li Yutang was reading, but he had the linguistic ability to read everyone, right? Right. Lao Shu Lao Shu went on a pilgrimage while he was living in London. He went on a pilgrimage to Dublin to see the locations from, <laughs> from Ulysses, for instance. So, so they were very aware of, of Western modernist writing. You know from the uh, May 4th movement that one of the major things involved in that was translating writers, the Bloomsbury writers, right? right. Wolf, as well as Catherine Mansfield and, and, and writers like this. So people were reading all of this. They were reading uh, Lawrence in English. Uh, I mean, he would have been able to read a Lawrence. I wrote a thing about book censorship 
in Shanghai that included, you know, uh, Lady Chatterley's lover being censored there, but copies being available. Mm. Um, so he's reading all of this. So there's definitely a feel. And if you look at, um, if you can find a copy again in the Royal Asiatic Society China series of Andrew Field's translations of Mu Xia Ying's short stories, you'll see there. And, and in, um, if you're talking about Lao Xia and Cat Country, also talking about Lao Xia, is, although it's more of a novel, M- Mr. Ma and Son, Urama, uh, mm. that w- within these books, there's all sorts of ideas of modernism. And here in this short piece, we get lots of the leitmotifs of modernism. Now, I'm not a modernist scholar, so I'm just going to say things like, you know, repetition of the same phrasing, you know, right. coming around to people, mentioning real places, choosing things that are obviously signs of modernity right the pink-eyed electric rabbits um think you know um, chinese eating with western cutlery things like that right i mean this is this is very much um you know the techniques of modernism that are being used everywhere and i think historically we've really only understood modernism as a european phenomenon with a little bit of an american offshoot Right. Um, well, if you learned it in Europe, I guess in America, you probably get more of an American ownership. But we're now we're now learning that, you know, there were mo- modernist writing in Latin America, parts of Africa and, and also in other parts of Asia, certainly in Japan. Um, and also, you know, with writers like this in China to understand the, that there is a global modernism. There's a global phenomenon going on here and that all of these often these writers are often reading each other or at least, you know, the, the Chinese or the Japanese writers are, um, I mean, when we talk about books about Shanghai, I can talk about um, Yokomitsu Raichi. Um, you know, they are definitely reading the Chinese writers, right? So everyone's reading mm. everybody else and Westerners because their linguistic skills allow for it and the May 4th movement has led to translations. And this becomes very important. You know, it's only after this period that we hear people calling for literature, for the novel to be something that can be vernacular and part of um the whole political, social uh, advancement of the culture that's going on. And so I think this sits very neatly within that. Not everything Lin Yutang wrote was high modernism. He wrote all over the place. He was a jobbing writer, right? He had to Mm. make a living. Um, But, you know, he is obviously being influenced by modernist writing from elsewhere. We also know that, which someone else can talk about in much more detail, that the famous bookshop, whose name escapes me now, uh, in, uh, that was run by a Japanese in Shanghai where Lu Shun and everyone went to buy their books and had salons where they sat down. You know, this is, he was also a, a Christian Japanese as well. I don't know if Lin Yutang went to that bookshop, which was in Hong Kong, but, you know, um, there was a, one of the things that's been lost in the sort of post-war political divisions and arguments that go is this great backwards and forwards and fusions and interactions between Japanese and Chinese writers, creative people, and and modernity, right? Japanese and Chinese modernity. And that's been rather sidelined by by post-war politics, but it was massive in the interwar period. Was that bookshop the Uchiyo... Yeah, Uchiyama, the the, the Uchiyama bookshop, yeah. Um, I mean, there's been quite a lot of work done on it and and various people. John Van Fleet at the Royal Asiatic Society in Shanghai, who is a a Japanese scholar as well as a a China scholar, has has done quite a lot of work on it. There was a book uh, recently about it. It, The building is still there, actually. I think it's, well, like everything in Shanghai, it's a convenience store or something. I think it's an ICBC bank. Yeah, that's it, ICBC bank with a kind of Lawson's or something next door. Yeah. But um, yeah, uh, it's a very, that's a very interesting story. And of course, that, that relationship got very poisoned around this time because of the Japanese attacks. So that Mm. kind of fluidity of interaction that was taking place in what was called Little Tokyo, just over the Sujo Creek in um, Hong Kong, um, and also with many, many people, Sun Yat-sen included, going to study in Japan, not just in America, but going to study in Japan and taking ideas from Japan about Asian modernity, Asian strength, self-strengthening movement and all of that mm. is, is coming from Japan. And that often is overlooked in analysis of what these guys and women as well were all doing at the time, right? Japan was a much bigger cultural presence in their life than it probably is for Chinese writers today. Right, yeah, it's an interesting thing which I'd love to know more about, but uh, don't. We should also mention Angus because yes. otherwise you'll get lots of emails on it. The other thing that Lin Yu Tung in America spent a long time trying to do was develop the notion of a Chinese typewriter. Yeah. So he tried to do this, and I'm not going to talk about that at all because Thomas Mullaney has written a great book called The Chinese Typewriter, which is which is all about that. I mean, mm. I've seen a few of them, but I don't really, um, yeah. 
it, it, it's a fascinating idea of trying to develop a way of actually having a functioning fast typewriter that can do the Chinese characters. Yes. It's fascinating. Um, strike me down, listeners, if I forget, but I'll try and get a link to something about the New Tang's uh, typewriter work in, in the show notes. There was something I was going to say. It, this is not strictly very relevant, and I don't know if this is relevant to modernism, but since we're talking about La Shua and Cat Country, and you mentioned Japanese writing about the same time, have you heard of a Japanese book whose English name is I Am a Cat by Natsume Soseki? I have heard of it, but I, I'm afraid I've I've never uh, I've never read it. Mm, it's the only Japanese thing from the, this sort of era I've read, and yeah. I don't really don't know if if you, if it would be qualified as as modernist. But it's kind of about society modernizing Japan, societal norms, and f- kind of family the ridiculousness of some family dynamics. But the interesting spin is it's all told from the point of view of a cat, and the cat. Yes. thinks a lot of itself it's um it's a cat that thinks it's amazing yes. as all cats do and recently recently there was a book published by um a western writer nick bradley who's lived in tokyo a long time called the cat and the city which mm. does a similar thing for contemporary tokyo cool um yeah so if listeners know anything about such things um please do get in touch um, last question about him to shanghai here um when you when you read it what emotions do you feel or to phrase the question another way, what emotions do you see kind of um, in, injected into him to Shanghai? Like, this, is it all discussed? Is there any admiration? Is there anything else in there? Or what do you think? Well, you know, I mean, I think you can criticize things a lot, but still quite like them, can't you really? I mean, you know, yes. you can talk about the sin of young people doing drugs and having casual sex and drinking all night and going out to nightclubs. And isn't that, isn't that really awful? And then think, you know, wow. Anyway, I did, but um, <laughs> I think um, I, I, I think uh, for me as a writer, it's a very good reminder. I look at it quite often. I look at that and I put it alongside a piece by Langston Hughes, who, of course, the great Harlem Renaissance poet who visited um, Shanghai around the mid-1930s. I've written about him in my collection of essays, Destination Shanghai, about the time he spent in Shanghai. At the Canidrome, at the dog racing track, largely, because there was American jazz going on there, and how he moved with a woman, mixed with a woman called Irene West, who um, rather fascinatingly was a white woman who booked lots of the jazz bands to come to Shanghai. And he was able to sit in the gardens of the Canidrome and have a drink and talk to her, and no one worried about it because there wasn't any official color bar Mm. uh, segregation in Shanghai. That's not to say that American soldiers didn't cause trouble sometimes or that hotels, including the YMCA, didn't sometimes refuse black guests. But um, he felt, you know, this was very different to being in America. He wrote a poem later when he got back to America after Japan invaded the 1937 invasion called Raw China. It's very easy to find online. Raw as in a lion's roar. Right. And in it, he talks about all the things he didn't like about Shanghai, all the things that were problems. You know, the hotels that wouldn't let a black man stay there, the the, 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 the other problems that he had, things that annoyed him about the colonial divisions in Shanghai. But then he also talks about, you know, that this city is now under attack by Japan. It, it's, it's not a long poem, but it's a very powerful poem. And it stands as an interesting counterpoint to to Lin Yu Tung's hymn for Shanghai, and that it is it is a defect it is it is calling for a support for Shanghai. In fact, Hughes's poem I think was first published in the New Masses, which is which was the newspaper of the American Communist Party, and um, at, at, it, it is not afraid to criticise Shanghai. Yet it recognises that there is a greater danger to this city. The idea is, of mm. course, you have to resist that danger and come out of that to create something better newer something that we un- that is greater and of course that's an idea that's very much with us at the moment with the pandemic and with black lives matter and, and, and other things that you know that we're going through a bad time we have to be open and we have to be critical but the idea of all of that is that we come out of this stronger and with better ideas now whether or not that happens is another thing but you know that's sort of an idea that's with us now and i think you know l- look up langston hughes's poem and take a moment to read that it, it, that's a very interesting uh, mm. counter- counterpoint well said. So now I'm going to jump to the, some some technical questions about the about the piece. These were going to be sort of translation related questions, although we basically answered them all already. So I'm going to switch things up a little bit and just ask sort of more broad, in quotes, cultural sort of or historical sort of questions. 
originally I was going to ask what changed between 1930 and 1933 between the English and Chinese edition. We've covered that already. So I thought yeah. instead I'd ask, what do you think remains the same in today's Shanghai? Is there anything in Him to Shanghai Lin is describing which still fundamentally applies to date or is, is it all gone? Well, I think I sort of answered that before in the sense that, you know, if you want if you want to understand why Shanghai looks like it does, parts of it, but also the new parts of it. And if you want to understand why the Shanghainese have arguably have this terrible reputation in the rest of China for being rather money grabbing and rather vulgar in their looks, you know, in 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 their love of luxury brands and flashy nightclubs and flashy hotels and the verticality of uh, art deco, you know, this idea that tallest is best, right? All of those ideas are still really the Jing Pai versus the High Pai, right? And many, many people in Shanghai still em still embrace all of those, to use Ling Yu Tung's terms, vulgarities, right? And and that's okay. I mean, we look at every society in the world. There are there are people who embrace the no vulgar notion of things, right? I mean, Kardashians, mm. <laughs> um, you know. Uh, so 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 this always um, happens, and it's very interesting that this is a great melting pot of Chinese people. Let's forget the foreigners from one side, but remember mm. Shanghainese people, you know, they don't often go back more than three or four generations, right? I mean, right. they are, they're from somewhere else and that can be as far south as Guangdong and, and, you know, certainly inland a fair way, but they have all merged and mixed in a certain way. And out of that has come Shanghai Hua and Shanghai dialect. And, you know, there, there's, there has come a common culture um uh, and a common way of communicating and a common way of really viewing the world i think that is still identifiably shanghainese and and a lot of that with a sort of uh, a, a love of wealth and the showiness of wealth which is called by people i think who've only just encountered shanghai oh well aren't the shanghai nouveau riche well no they're not nouveau riche now because that's that's kind of china that's the last vestige of china old money from from before the revolution mm. right? you know it's right. kind of you know built built itself up that way so it's not really a kind of nouveau riche it's just a rediscovery of a tradition that lived before we could argue that there was always another tradition there i mean if you think of zhao xin made the poet right um, who who ended up you know, having the relationship with Emily Hahn and they created literary journals and everything. I mean, he always lived in a kind of a, a courtyard house, not quite a Peking courtyard house, but a, but a sort of a courtyard house. Never lived in a modern, never lived in modern apartment blocks and so on. So, so before 1949, there was an older Shanghai, a, a more mm. ancient sort of money culture, mostly around the old town and, and things like that. Nowadays, people think of the old town as being the poorest part of the city and, you know, very run down what's left of it and falling apart. But of course, there's some beautiful low level properties that, that predate the Treaty Port era, still just about left there. So mm -hmm. that's kind of worth remembering. And then this new Shanghai notion of being Shanghainese comes on top of that, uh, ignoring the foreigners. And, um, you know, that, that becomes something that I think you can still sort of um, see very strongly in Shanghai tastes and what, what sort of things they favor in terms of fashion and, and, and culture. Uh, you know, um, it, th those things are still very important, even in a very, very changed China. Mm. So, Unsurprisingly, in the, in the last answer and throughout the whole episode, interview, whatever, we've been talking a lot about um, cultural um, mixture or high pie, or maybe the, the term I like to use these days is cultural exchange. Just seems very wholesome to me, that phrase cultural exchange. So but whatever term we use, um, do you think the nature of cultural mixing or exchange has, well, I know it's changed, um, but do you think is exchange or mixing of cultures still as kind of rich and important as it used to be, as well as having kind of shifted with, with the changing times in Shanghai or, or just universally? I, I think that Shanghai is still very, very good, as are port cities around the world. I think that the, the fact that Shanghai is a port should never be forgotten. Mm. Cities like that are very, very good at taking the best from everything that passes by. Now, of course, you know, if you're an extreme nationalist, or you're prejudiced in some way, you're not going to agree with this. But I would argue that, you know, my own city, London, you know, has thrived and is stronger and is a world city because it has, uh, you know, largely taken in the world in various forms, right? And, and in forms of different culture, different people, different beliefs. And so therefore, 
and been very tolerant of them. Now, we may be going through a slightly less tolerant period at the moment, but in general, over a sort of two, three hundred years, it's become a global city that way. And Shanghai, similarly at that time, that, that process happened in Shanghai. Now, whether the origins of that process are very good, colonialism and being forced to open up, or even in London, you know, uber capitalism, to which there are many losers and few winners, um, mm. you know, uh, th- th- this can all be arg- argued. What it does, though, is create um, cities with an identifiable culture and a sense of that. And um, I think that that's sort of uh, rather important in, in trying to understand why Shanghai is Shanghai in a way that we might try and understand, you know, why is London, London, Paris, Paris, New York, New York, Tokyo, Tokyo. All of these things are, are quite important. It's interesting at the moment that you know, you could argue now that, well, they're trying to stop certain things coming into Shanghai, internet controls and so on. But there were always controls. In the nationalist mm. regime, films were always censored, um, whether if, if it was because they felt they showed a bad impression of China or they offended one or other group within the international settlement. Books, similarly, were always censored. I mentioned Lady Chatterley's Lovers. I mean, I've, in the Royal Asiatic Society Journal several years ago, I wrote a, about a whole police crackdown on on Western literature by Western police, right? Largely, oh. largely any Western literature. I tried to work out what the common uh, thread was for books that were banned. And mm. actually, uh, Professor Robert Bickers answered the question, which was any book like Lady Chatterley's Lover that shows a middle class or bourgeois Western woman succumbing to the temptations of the flesh, shall we say, mm. was a bad idea because Chinese people like Lin Yu Tang could read that and. <laughs> Would, and it the would, illusion it would, would be it would diminish, yeah, the, it would diminish the Western woman in the eyes of the right. Chinese. So, so that's why it was going on then. So, so, of course, the reasons for censoring change, but censorship has been a constant all the way through mm. um, China's history. What was interesting about Shanghai before 1949 was that, of course, it was very difficult to censor anything within the concession. So Nanjing was always looking to censor things. I don't know, anime Wong films. Uh, you know, various other things. Um, and um, they would uh, they would be able to censor it in most parts of China, but they couldn't necessarily do it in the concession. But the concession itself would, would censor some things over others. So all sorts of stuff is going on. But in general, it's a very legally light regime, which is why most of your Chinese newspapers are based there. Most of your Chinese writers are living and working there. Your Chinese film studios are there. And again, this is that contradiction between a city that is created really through colonialism and and violence, right? That also then becomes a refuge for creative people, for journalists, for artists, for writers, uh, for filmmakers. And and that's one of the great contradictions of Shanghai. Right. And I guess we could say, so long as there's censorship, there are ways around censorship. And today it's, it's, I guess, VPNs and there would have been... Yeah, well, for many Chinese people, for many Chinese... For for many Chinese newspaper owners, the way around censorship in China was to base yourself in Shanghai, Uh i.e. beyond Chinese law, right? So if you're a Chinese film studio, you could still make your films without any interference. The Chinese government could then interfere with them perhaps when they tried to show them at cinemas, but at least they got made. So, Mm. so, you know, um, and at least people like, uh, you know, the writers could sort of move around freely without risk of a knock on the door at any time. But of course, it, it, it was a an unsatisfactory situation. It wasn't one that people wanted to to be permanent. But, you know, don't forget, the Communist Party of China was formed in the French concession, right? Because they would have probably Mm. been arrested immediately outside of the (laughs) French concession, right? So, so you know, you can use, you can even use treaty ports. You use, you know, in the way that you use VPNs or use whatever, or the way that Hong Kong used to be used or or, or whatever, right? You know, Mm. you you have to find new ways around these. Um, And and Mm. Shanghai was a way around things for, for many Chinese in those days. I was trying to think of a reason to bring up St. Andrews again, and that's actually made me think the idea of like a, a one set of laws being transplanted to another place. So I, I was making fun of St. Andrews before calling it an, an, an English treaty port. I left out the biggest um, kind of quote unquote foreign population, the Americans. Um, it's kind of an American uh, zone as well. And that apparently has been a source of drama. I don't know if it was this year or recent years um, where a fraternity got in trouble. So this is like the American uh, frat boy thing where in that strange country, um, these lads engage in horribly toxic laddish behavior and it's kind of institutionalized in these fraternity societies. And this 
I think it, it wasn't the university. The university doesn't want to cut off their supply of American tuition fees, but basically some, some uh, frat boys operating in St. Andrews did some awful stuff and there was calls for their fraternity to be shut down and they said no like we are uh we have a right to operate here but the, then it raises the question of why why should an american organization have these chapters in other universities in other countries i mean i, I know analogies are a muddy business and i don't want to say this is the same as foreign uh, powers in shanghai but it's yeah i feel like in, in some ways these these things are endlessly interesting and and tricky to get your head around well, I'd say several things. One is you better back off from St. Andrews, I think, because um, they've just uh, put a lot of money into a new China center up there. Yes. Which, uh, we've yeah, got and, things yeah. with Professor Gregory Lee uh, yes. moving to, to run it. So, you know, we're all kind of uh, looking forward to great <laughs> things from St. Andrews at the moment. That's mm. the first thing. Secondly, people have always, um, have always got around uh, different laws and, and used these things selectively. In Shanghai, as I said, in the, in the international settlement, you had extraterritoriality, whereby you were subject to the laws of your own country. But of course, you were living alongside all sorts of other countries who had very different laws. So the most obvious one was when America introduced prohibition, right, the Volstead Act, that meant you couldn't drink alcohol, that technically applied to every American in Shanghai. But not one American judge or American institution tried to stop Americans from drinking in Shanghai, where right. obviously, you know, everybody else, Chinese and foreign, was merrily going along drinking wherever they, whatever they wanted, whenever they mm. wanted, right? You know, so, so they, they sort of even then were selected. I don't think anybody in Washington ever got onto, there might have been some missionaries or so on, but there was obviously a temperance league, but nobody tried to walk into a nightclub in Shanghai and say, right, all the British and French over there drinking whiskey and wine, no problem, right? The Americans over here, give them all a Coca-Cola and an orange juice, right? I mean, you know, it, it, it wasn't, no way. It, wasn't, it wasn't good. That was never going to work. So it never happened. And mm. there's a very funny story once of the Shanghai Express, the train that went between um, Shanghai and Beijing, obviously famous for the Marlena Dietrich anime Wong film, was often treated as an international zone. Um, and mm. there was once a delegation of visiting American congressmen during the Prohibition era. And they got on the train in Shanghai heading towards Beijing. And as soon as the train took off, they decided to head down to the bar, right? You know, this is great. We can drink on a train. We used to be able to do that in America. Now we can't. The Chinese, not wishing to insult their American guests, closed the bar uh, because they didn't want the Americans to feel that they would be tempted to break uh, their own laws. And it eventually which... involved the Americans having to find an Englishman to go there and demand that the bar was open because oh, prohibition yeah. wasn't his bloody law, right? You know, and he got it open and then they all... Um, they, they all uh, managed to drink all the way to Peking. But it was, um, yeah, so, so there are always very funny things going on. And to go back to your point about why read Lin, Lin Yu Tung, this, this is a very important point. I'm always very conscious when I write anything that I write um, about Shanghai. And I do tend to, I write about the foreigners in Shanghai. That's my kind of groove, the, the sort mm. of uh, furrow that I plow. Um, and I like doing it and it has good audiences. It's all translated into Chinese. I have quite a nice big readership oh. in, in China that's very interested cool. in all of this stuff um, and finds it another aspect of their own um, history that maybe they don't get from other books, whether it's, you know, unsolved murders in Beijing in the 1930s or foreign gangsters in Shanghai. And um, I'm always very careful that, you know, you need to balance a certain amount of nostalgia with a certain amount of reality. Right? Yeah. And, and that always needs to be looked at. And I don't think... Um, I think I get an okay balance. Um, I mean, I work very hard to try and get that balance. And I, and I get, I'm reasonably dismissive of, of a lot of the old Shanghai books that are just pure nostalgia and don't balance that against the social conditions that are going on at the time. Um, right. I, I probably have a better way of getting around it in that I tend to focus on those foreigners who've been forgotten in the traditional narratives of old Shanghai. So not the, the wealthy and the diplomats and the missionaries and the businessmen. I tend to focus on the showgirls and the prostitutes and the gangsters and the refugees, right? So I'm kind of down on the social scale anyway. So maybe it's easier to balance it with the situation for, you know, the vast majority of Shanghai, which is poor Chinese, right? So... Mm -hmm. And I think Lin Yu Tung, as with Raw China by Langston Hughes that I mentioned, reminds me every time I read it that there is this, you know, that we have to get this balance 
of what's going on right when we look at when we look at old Shanghai. Totally. Um, it's a thing I, it's not exactly the same, but a very similar thing I bump up against on the podcast is wanting to be very chatty and casual, but swiftly realizing I do have to be sensitive because it's hard not to run into some sort of a sensitive issue talking about Chinese literature, history, culture. Um, there's just lots of ways you can be a, a prat, basically. So is, the balance for me is being fun, but not being, you know, careless and, and, and stupid and insensitive. And it's, yeah, it's, I, it's great that you've struck a balance. I mean, I, 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 I take a lot from, obviously, I show all my work to people whose views I uh, value, but also all of my work, because it mostly goes straight into Chinese, gets sent to my Chinese publisher the same day it gets sent to my UK and American publishers. Right. Um, and, he, you know, I've had the same publisher in China for quite a long time. He's a very big publisher. He's, I think, got very good taste. <laughs> um, but by which I mean that I think he can, there's lots of books about China he could publish and some he does and some he doesn't. And I think, you know, I think he would, he would tell me if he was finding anything there that that mm. is annoying. I mean, I know that there's nothing really to annoy the government as such because I'm writing about a different time and different sorts of things. Right. It's really about whether or not, you know, you're, you're tending to forget one group over another group or whatever. Um, um, his general feeling is that it kind of shines a light on, um, on, on different aspects of, of Chinese history and, and in Shanghai and both Shanghai and uh, Peking now I have um, famous, uh, well, I think they're famous uh, walking tours of the sites of City of Devils and of, and, and of a long running one in Beijing of the sites of Midnight in Peking, which has gone on and on and started off with sort of uh, foreigners who'd read the book, expats who live there who are interested to see things, but also now Chinese groups doing that as well. Um, cool. So that's kind of um, how I figure i'm getting it getting it right i'm much more keen to read my reviews on web or on wechat than i am on amazon <laughs> you know i mean i read the ones on amazon as well but uh, even the one star ones but it's like uh, i'm very interested in what what chinese audience feels and you know a lot of the time when i'm going around china because i lived there for a long time obviously and know a lot of people i, I do do book tours around china and um, it's always really fascinating to meet with 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 Chinese audiences, particularly if they've had the chance to read the book. And I always find that, that that's sort of one of the most interesting groups of readers I can meet. A lot of the time when I'm going on book tour around America or somewhere, it's very much almost like giving lectures about Shanghai. There's this place, mm. it was this, it was that. I don't have to do a lot of that in China. And um, it's kind of um, fascinating to watch people rediscovering their own history and watching a Chinese audience sort of interpret, you know, what, what I am writing about how I see Shanghai and how they see Shanghai is, you know, sometimes the same, sometimes different. And those areas of difference and similarity are fascinating. Totally. Um, as you were kind of relaying to me some of the stories, I was thinking of Chinese people. I knew uh, there were two colleagues in particular. <clears throat> there was <clears throat> the librarian at the school I worked at. He would he would often talk about the kind of family he was descended from who were apparently members of the walled city of old Shanghai since since forever. So he was very proud to be Shanghainese with a, you know, capital S in bold. And there was another lady um, who was one of the primary school teachers and sh she was Chinese. Looking at her, you, you would just be seeing a normal Chinese woman. But just, I, I forget why it came up in conversation, but she happened to mention one time that one of her grandparents was Russian and uh, he'd come over, I guess, fleeing the Russian civil war or something <clears throat> and proceeded to tell the story of how her grandfather learned not Mandarin, but Shanghainese and became a, just a normal Shukuman resident and would play Mahjong with all the other Shanghainese people. And yeah, it's, um, it's not so extraordinary that I bumped into people like this in Shanghai. It's just part, of the, um, just part of the fabric of the city. So it's great that you're able to talk about people who might have their own stories related to the things that you've been researching and, and writing about. It was certainly something I liked about Shanghai when I first went there you know, when I first went there, which is a long, long time ago now, um, was was that it was something that, you know, I mean, when you go somewhere and it's very, very strange and you're not quite sure if you're going to be happy there, you kind of look for similarities with, with where you come from and what you do. And mm. one, one of the things about where I came from in North London is it's probably the most, you know, it, well, it is the most multicultural part of the country. And so I grew up in an extremely multicultural environment with people from all sorts of backgrounds. And um, so, so all of that, sort of multiculturalism comes very naturally to me because I sort of grew up with it and I sort of 
you know, jumped in with both feet rather than resisting it. I liked it. So um, when I went to Shanghai and I started meeting people, you know, and when you got talking to people who would be like, oh, my grandfather was from Guangzhou and came here as a tailor or I was from Xiamen who came here to run a restaurant, you know, was was from Jiangsu and came here to do nothing particularly, you know. <laughs> uh, and and also, of course, at the time that I was first there in the 90s was really when the, the, the whole... Um, migrant worker thing was 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 really getting going in right. china so so the city was having this new uh, influx of people from uh, well all over again particularly from jiangsu and uh, around anhui yeah and anhui and um you know th- this process was happening again and it was sort of interesting to see that you know here was this new lot coming in encountering a little, sometimes a little bit of hostility a little bit of snobbishness a little bit of resistance from from those that saw themselves as shanghainese who at lunchtime were proudly telling me about how they were really you know one one or two generations back from mm. guangdong and look they still spoke cantonese with with grandma or whatever right you know so so th- that felt to me sort of very familiar to coming from somewhere like north london where you know uh, lots of people had were, were first or second generation something or other right you know right. Um, whether it be uh, you know caribbean or, or indian south asian or you know in my area as well you know uh, just jewish or whatever right it was it was that kind of um, everyone thrown together and a, and, a, and a layered on top of that is the fact that everyone was kind of london right you know Right. Um, and I kind of felt that that was sort of hopefully what would happen, what had happened in Shanghai had happened, uh, but hopefully would happen again with this new influx of migrant workers that were coming in and were hopefully going to marry and settle and have children and find success. Um, and that they too would, would, would be the next layer of the sort of, you know, fascinating, fascinating blumange of Shanghai. Mm. Okay. Last of these kind of a uh, cultural sort of questions. It's another well, keeping the geographic theme going. So you mentioned before that it's you always felt it was kind of stupid when these um, Western scholars would fixate on like Shanghai versus Beijing. Uh, but we also kind of talked about how um, Lin Yutang was torn or maybe torn is too dramatic, kind of f- going back and forth between Shanghai Haipai and Beijing uh, Jingpai. So I guess the question here is how helpful or um, useful or attached to reality is it to view shanghai and beijing as like polar opposites but i think that there are some some reasons that become apparent to me in my research that sometimes just strike you and you think why didn't i realize that before i wrote a book a couple of years ago called destination shanghai which was about lots of different foreigners that came to shanghai some you'll have heard of but didn't associate with Shanghai, like Eugene O'Neill or, or Langston Hughes or something like that. Others you'd never heard of. And I did another book that I've just finished and sent off to the publishers called Destination Peking, which is another group of foreigners who lived in Beijing. And the ones, the group of foreigners that interest me very much in Beijing are the, um, the aesthete, mostly English and American aesthetes. Um, and and most, many of them were um, gay, gay men. And I was always mm. trying to work out, you know, why was there this... Uh, this gay male community in Beijing but of all the work I've done and I've probably done more work on the underworld of Shanghai than anyone really particularly the foreign underworld of Shanghai I've come across every kind of thing going but I never come across a gay club right no one ever mentions it and I thought okay so what's going on here I don't know why it took me a long time and I suddenly worked out that of course it's extraterritoriality so I went to all these things of like oh well gay men are more aesthetic right you know they liked the the hutongs and the eaved roofs and the swallows with flutes and things like that but you know that's that's not a very good reason the reason was that um if you were English and gay or American and gay and you were in Shanghai and you were uh caught for something like that, uh, you were prosecuted, right? Uh, unnatural acts, buggery, wh- whatever the, the the charge would be. But in mm. Beijing, although there wasn't really, the, the laws were a little bit more fluid on things like that. It wasn't really, you know, it wasn't that it was necessarily, there were laws promoting it, but it, you could kind of get away with it. So I think that that's why we saw, for instance, aesthetes gather uh, in um, Beijing more than Shanghai. Um, so sometimes, you know, the, the 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 reasons why people went to certain places were were governed by the by the the system, the political and social system that that's in place there. Mm. Um, and I and I think that's sort of interesting. So so many people who 
And of course, if you really wanted to do business, you ended up going to Shanghai. If you were more interested, you know, many of the sort of people that we find that are collectors or specialists in pottery or ceramics or textiles or something, they tend to end up in um, in Beijing. Um, it seemed, and of course, nowadays we've layered another another layer onto it, which is, you know, when I got when I first got to Beijing late 80s um you know here i was waiting wanting to find the the beijing of harold acton and peonies and ponies you know his great comic novel yeah, of uh, right. of uh, beijing and, and of course what i found was a lot of you know what they used to call stalinist wedding cakes right these just these, these russian stalinist buildings around and of course i forgot that, that there was this whole school of communist architecture which had been dumped on top of the uh, on top of old beijing well of course you can still find or you certainly could then um now just about find some hutongs so um all of that was wonderful shanghai is wonderful i i kind of i just wish that that whole argument would go away and people i, I don't understand why people get get involved in it it's um mm. it's, a, it's a nonsensical argument uh, both cities have their own histories they've grown up the way that they have um if you're chinese there might be a good argument for, there might be a good argument to have but as a foreigner there really isn't um and if you're favoring one over the other i just think it's because you haven't learned enough about the other if you see what i mean it's um was it you're saying earlier like people who side with the place just because they have lived there or, or, or were born there it's kind of like primary oh, look, school you know, level you know, everyone does it I, I used to be driven mad when i was a student in london and um, every year, Time Out magazine in London would do two covers that they would send to every news agent. One would be a person in a T-shirt saying, I love North London. And the other would be a person in a T-shirt saying, I love South London. And I would go in as North London born and bred four or five generations, four or five generations. I might have. I would go into college and I'd have people who'd moved from, I don't know, Liverpool or Manchester. And just by chance, just by chance, had got a room in a shared house in Peckham. And they'd be, I love South London. I'd be like, that's just, you know, North London's rubbish. South London's great. So, you know, and you just be like, it's not your fight. You know, it's, just, it's, not, it's not your business. <laughs> Keep out of it. So, you know, it's kind of, um, yeah, I mean, pe- you know, I went to Glasgow at university and suddenly walked into an argument about, you know, whether people are from the South side or the East end and all, you know, not my argument. Right. So it's, it's kind of, um, it's, it's bizarre, but it's obviously something that happens everywhere, but it's bizarre that people should drop in, um, you know, usually by chance in one place or the other and then suddenly decide that i I suppose people always want verification that they've made the right decision Mm, that's reminded me this again this is not really an analogy at all it's just something that's reminded me it's about st andrews again um so i was kind of horrified i told you about the st andrews thing we can't (laughs) they've they've got a chinese department now we've got to support Uh, them this one's about the students not about the uni but yeah uh, gregory lee if you're listening just you know Come get me. Um, if you want to tell me off, if fine. But yeah, I, w- I was horrified to learn I'm from my girlfriend. I'm personally not going that far north, but you know. <laughs> mm, um, yeah, well, the wastelands of Fife are an interesting place. Um, but yeah, um, my, my girlfriend told me that um, this kind of residential suburban areas of St. Andrews where um, a lot of the students will stay if they leave halls so this, is, this is where like the normal people live the the non people who aren't attached to the university this is just their normal suburban neighborhood it's a pretty normal scottish suburb but the students of st andrews refer to it as the badlands and I heard that. I was like, what yeah <laughs> no that's just a normal neighborhood but who am i to tell them <laughs> okay ending on that very silly note um Let's go on to our kind of more lighthearted questions. I actually forgot to put these in our in our list of questions, but they're they're pretty easy. One was uh, what what's our word of the day going to be? I, I know you already suggested uh, the word for vulgarity in Chinese, so we okay. can maybe do that one. No, uh, unless I'm going to do. I'm going to do one. Let me right. just, let me just check it. <laughs> okay, because <laughs> it's not a word anyone will know, but it's a word mm. everyone would have known at that time. Hang on. Right. And I, I used it in my Audible original. And I just need to call that up just to check what it is. Where is it? Final edit. If, you've, if you're an Audible account, by the way, you should get that. It's good fun. What is, what is it? It's called Murders of Old China. It's 12 murders that took place in the first half of the 20th century in China. There and I go it. back and reinvestigate them. And it's an, just okay. for Audible, you know. Listeners, take note. Okay, so... Um, in interwar Shanghai, of course, the major way to get around was by rickshaw. And rickshaws were, were pulled by, uh, obviously, Chinese. In fact, at one point, um, some very poor Russian men 
tried to become rickshaw pullers and um, the municipal council wouldn't allow it because they felt it would denigrate the white man in the eye of the Chinese. Oh, anyway, <clears throat> there's lots of words that people who don't speak Chinese or haven't studied Chinese but end up in China sort of know, right? So, you know, within mm. a few weeks, people know how to call a taxi and how to tell it to turn right, turn left, things like that. And you have lots of phrases like sort of junta, you know, that, you know, you know these, these sort of phrases that come about. And, and yeah. pe people sort of know them, even if they don't speak Chinese. Okay. There, are, there are words that every foreigner would have known. And one of them is Huang Bao Chu, as in yellow carriage. And this was the word that you shouted when you wanted a rickshaw. You stood by the pavement, you put your hand out and you shouted Huang Bao Chu. And any passing rickshawman who didn't have a fare would pull over, sometimes several of them, and that would be how you would do it. Now, they were so commonly used, rickshaws, and they were so cheap that most foreigners would use them several times a day. So really, and, and all social classes of foreigners used them as well. So, and there were certain grades of rickshaw from the slightly more rickety up to the ones with pneumatic tires and cushions and things. But all of them, you shouted Huang Bao Chu. And that was because at one point, the largest uh, rickshaw company in Shanghai, um, all their rickshaws were yellow color. So Huang, uh, Huang Se, the, the Huang. Uh, and um, uh, that was what, and it became the word for rickshaw. And I think that's a word that like nobody knows now, but every no. single foreigner in Shanghai would have known in, you know, the time when Lin Yutong wrote this hymn of Shanghai. And you would have heard it multiple times every day as you walked down the street. You would have just heard people, Huang Bao Chu, Huang Bao Chu, China, you know, shouting it and all of the rickshaws pulling over. So there were thousands, thousands, tens of thousands of rickshaws in Shanghai at that time. It was such a sort of common entry job for migrant workers coming in from the, from the countryside. Um, hmm. So th that's my word. And I want everyone to remember, if you ever need to call a rickshaw in 1930 Shanghai, you will now know how to do it. All right. Well, if I'm ever wandering back into the 30s in Shanghai, I will, I will do that. If it, if it ever comes about i believe it's a feature on iphone 35 you just have to long <laughs> enough to wait for it to come out good i will i will try not to die um our next question is another silly question if him to shanghai was a drink what drink do you think it would be if him to shanghai was a drink the only drink it could possibly be would be a stenger s-t-e-n-g-a-h the drink of shanghai because Shanghai is not a tropical city, was not a gin and tonic, didn't need to ward off mm. the mosquitoes. <clears throat> it was a whiskey soda. Right. And a whiskey soda in Shanghai and throughout Asia was always known, for some reason I do not know, as a stenger. And that was the sort of house drink of Shanghai. It's a strange word. I can't think what like the etymological root would be. It sounds almost German, maybe. Now, but some final questions here. Um, you've already recommended quite a few books for our listeners, um, but just here at this kind of end note, is there one or two you'd really like to recommend to people listening? Well, I think um, you know books on Shanghai. Most people know the major books on Shanghai, and if you go online, you can find. I did a kind of ten books on old Shanghai for for the guardian once and i've also done the, mm. the five books website i did another one there caused some consternation by recommending shanghai baby by weiwei but I, i'm oh, going to yeah. stand by that i still think that's a good book only people that weren't in shanghai in the 90s think that's a bad book uh, well there might be some who are in shanghai in the 90s who think it's a bad book but i mean if you're in shanghai in the 90s in the slightly wild west era of jiang zemin and and the boom time of the city um that that book really recreates it very well because she was there right she was a player mm. um so so that's a sort of a modern book i mentioned man's fate by andre mauro and i still think that's worth um rereading sadly no one ever made a film of that william goldman who wrote a fantastic book about screenwriting points out that it has one of the strongest openings of any novel i'm not going to give it away but it's a fantastic opening to the novel very shanghai um, mm. And it's never been filmed but actually there is a script of it somewhere when bertolucci bernardo bertolucci Oh. three scripts and we'll choose one one i don't know what it was the other was a was one for man's fate but man's fate is set during 1927 and at that time it was thought that politically that could be a bit problematic and the third was mm. a script about the last emperor and they went for the last emperor um so right. man, man's fate still hasn't been made um so i'm going to recommend uh i'm going to recommend a book that i think is an interesting one having read him of shanghai it's by a japanese writer called yoko mitsu raichi R double I C H I, and it's just called Shanghai. There is a translation of it uh, that was done some years ago that I know you can pick up secondhand or online. Um, Raichi was one of the 
uh, new sensationalists or new sensualists of uh, Japanese writing um, that was very inspirational on many Chinese writers, a form of sort of early Japanese modernism um, that the other writers were involved in as well. Uh, he, but he came and visited Shanghai in the 1920s and he went away and wrote this book Shanghai afterwards. It's not very long. It's really a novella. Uh, mm. And it, it doesn't have very precise. It's not like one of my books as a precise, you are on the corner of Fu Chao Lu and Qiang Si Lu or something, you know, Fu Zhou Lu and Jiang si, Jiang Su Lu or something. It mm. doesn't have that. It just has a, a feel, an air, an atmosphere of Shanghai as this Japanese man moves through it, largely through um, Little Tokyo and the Japanese areas of Shanghai. But it it has a wonderful sort of feeling of being in a being in a strange city where some things are so familiar, other things are so foreign, feeling at times that you're on another continent, Europe or America, but realizing that you're still in Asia, being able to drop into places that are very familiar, geisha houses, bath houses and things. But on the other side, walking out into completely Chinese streets, not understanding the local dialect, you know, being surprised at you know, Sikh policemen, um, f foreigners striding around, all, all of that sort of thing. Um, it, it, it's, it's really a book about Shanghai that isn't read that often and isn't considered one of the sort of classics. It's not like Mao Dun's Midnight or, um, you know, one of the other by Chinese writers. So, so I kind of recognize that. I think other people know, know a lot, know most of the other major books. I mean, if you want to look for books about foreigners in Shanghai, I would say there's two novels that I think are worth digging out if you can find them. One is Emily Harm. No one much reads Miss Jill by Emily Harm, which is about a young American girl coming to Shanghai and, uh, you know, falling through the cracks and uh, uh, ending up in a rather dissipated state. And that's a, that's a nice novel and not one of Emily Hahn's better known books. And there's another one by a man called Maurice de Cobra, who was a French writer who was an absolute bestseller in the 1930s and is very rarely read now. And he wrote about lots of places, wonderful books about Paris. But he also traveled internationally and wrote books about uh, various places. And he wrote a book called Shanghai Honeymoon, which sounds very frivolous, has one of the best descriptions of Shanghai in its opening two pages. And then goes on to tell the story of a, a mother and her daughter that get a sort of um, stranded in Shanghai and again have to sort of find a way to survive and, and it's about foreigners in Shanghai I recommend ones that are about foreigners in Shanghai because I think other people will have talked about Chinese writing on Shanghai so that's two by um, by a Frenchman an American and a Japanese awesome thank you for all those recommendations I'll, I'll be sure to get those all into the show notes um funny you mentioned Shanghai baby and um, this one's been on my mind because one to, of the first three episodes I did, uh, one was on Wang Shuo, one was on Mu Rong Shui Sun, and I've kind of had a continued interest in writers like that, sort of like literary bad boys who were, especially I think those two writing around, I think I guess spanning from like the 80s. So this kind of period in in modern China that's a bit more was a little bit more unhinged than, than it is now. And I always thought, as as much as I enjoy reading these books, they're all kind of books of men behaving badly by men um so i was interested in hearing about shanghai baby which from what i've gathered seems to be a similar sort of um tale of like bad behavior but it's by a woman and the main character is a woman but yeah um i'm not trying to grill you on that or anything but maybe just well, for listeners. You, this is the way i would describe it there, there are books about a certain time a place and a period that mm. don't necessarily appeal to the contemporary reader unless they want to read about that time and period and there are also books that that were incredibly widely read at the time that then don't get read very widely and i think right. at a time when everyone absolutely I, I mean you know i don't want to give my age away though it is pretty ancient now there was a time when everybody had a copy of jay mckinnon's bright lights big city and there was a time when everybody had a copy of brett easton ellis's american psycho those two books sat together on a shelf those two writers were very closely associated if you go back and read um, either of those books, if you knew New York at that time, America at that time, it's it's incredibly atmospheric. But I'm not sure that a young person who would have been when those books came out, you know, at school, uh, if even if they were born, quite honestly, now, um, they might go to that book and find all sorts of find it very problematic, find it confusing, perhaps find it wonder what all the fuss was about. Right. Mm. Um, and I think you can go back to a time and you can take 
Weiwei's uh, Shanghai Baby, which is a reasonably ephemeral book because it is about a moment. It's about an ephemeral moment in an ephemeral city lived by ephemeral people, right? And right. I include myself in that because we were not, it was not a group of people who were looking to the future. It wasn't a group of people who, who were trying to chart China's destiny or anything. It was a group of people who for random reasons on the Chinese side of birth largely, on our side, just what option you did at university or just who get offered you a job somewhere had ended up in Shanghai at one of the sort of craziest times, right? In, in mm -hmm. the Jiang Zemin go-go nineties. -go um, uh, there was no, and, and we're young. Right. So living like young people with all the things that young people do, but suddenly in a place where that was possible and it hadn't been possible before, not for several decades anyway. Right. And, and I think if you put that book with uh, Mian Mian's book, Candy, uh, which is not strictly about Shanghai, but but is about being and is a slightly more thoughtful and, and slightly better written book as well. I think, you know, if you read those two, I'd be very interested to see what people make of them. But mm. As I've argued with other people who ask me to choose their books and they say, well, Mian Mian's a terrible book. It's rubbish. I don't like it, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, but you know, you were at primary school <laughs> when all this was going on, right? It's not your moment, right? So it's very difficult for you to critique that moment. Do you know what I mean? So um, yeah, yes, you yeah. could say Wei Wei's Shanghai Baby is an ephemeral book, but this was an ephemeral time of ephemeral people, but it very brilliantly captures that period, I think. Um, it may not be mm. a period you approve of, I mean, the person that I was talking to was a rather young, uh, young person who was very keen on China and being very serious about it all and hadn't themselves spent their 20s largely drunk and on drugs, right? Like, like most of us. So it was kind of, um, you know, he hadn't really experienced a China that was ever like that. Right. It had all, he also spent all of his China time in Beijing. So it was always slightly more dur, slightly more mm. kind of like, you know, about pints of Yanjing and things like that. Not really about kind of, and if you went to a nightclub, it was a massive, great barnyard of a Chinese nightclub. It wasn't a kind of small underground, very mixed, mashed up kind of place. It was just a different right. sort of world and, and maybe not a very appealing world of fuerdi and, you know, people ordering Jack Daniels by the bottle and stuff. I mean, this wasn't what it was like in the 90s in Shanghai. It was much more rough and ready. And, and so he wasn't really able to understand that. And, and he also wasn't really taking the book as a historical document. He was trying to judge it through his own lens. And, and that's kind of wrong. And same as when we look at Lin Yu Tang, we have to try and look through the, the lens of Lin Yu Tang, looking at Art Deco architecture, looking at foreigners walk past him, looking at the Japanese and what they're doing to his city. If we don't understand it through his eyes, we're just not going to understand it at all. And it's, it's the same mm. with books of any period. Would you like to know how old I was when Shanghai Baby was published in its original Chinese? There you go. I was six. Yeah, there you go, see? <laughs> so, you know, well, I mean, I'll give it away. I was born in 1966, so I've just turned mm. 54, right? So I wasn't, I mean, I, I mean that, that was a real heyday for me, but I was lucky that it was the bridge with me. I, I had had some of the kind of, you know, craziness of the 80s in London, and then straight into the craziness of the 90s in Shanghai. I kind of got an extended decade that way. There you go. Um, yeah. That's a good deal. Yeah. Uh, final question for I also, you. I also got double the Please. amount of synth music, though, so it wasn't necessarily... Oh, no. Well, <laughs> every every cloud has its dark grey lining. Uh, what are you reading just now? That's the last question. Well, I tend to... Uh, well, I either read what I'm reviewing, which is boring, usually it was boring to talk about, so you can read the reviews. I kind of um, read people who I hope will inspire me. I, re I read people who I think who are doing exactly what I want to do. And that, that, I don't read them because I want to copy them. And I don't really think that happens. But I read them to try and see what it is that they're doing. Uh, at the moment, I'm on a massive kind of lockdown reread of Raymond Chandler. I'm just doing Chandler from book one all the way through. I should say I'm writing a book at the moment about Shanghai in the last few years. So 1947 to 49, which sort of is basically a book about what ha what happened to everyone, how they got out or how they didn't get out. Um, right. And so I want that kind of feel of the 1940s and American hard boiled and so on. So I'm rereading Chandler and, and enjoying that a lot. I am also rereading James Elroy because he's sort of like, you know, when I was doing City of Devils, he was very much in my mind. And I specifically didn't read him when I was doing City of Devils because I didn't want to be too influenced by books I'd read before and loved like L.A. Confidential. But I very much wanted to do what he did in L.A. Confidential, which was to tell the underground history of, of a city mm. um, fr from a point of fascination with that city, but not tell it through through the um, the eyes of um, the the wealthy and the privileged, tell it through the, the eyes of the, the struggling 
and, and those that had to sort of fight the foreigners in this case, gangsters and so on. Um, and you've, the other person... Actually, I, yeah, sorry, go on, go on. The other person I like a lot is Alan First, who's an American who writes usually about pre-war France and the coming of fascism and their espionage novels. But I like him a lot because he's a very good example of how to weave in lots of research without overloading and boring the reader. But they still get a great feel, the atmosphere again of, of occupied Paris. And, and I very much want to do that because what I like about First as well is that he manages to write books that have tension. And, and you know, even though you know that the Nazis are going to invade and occupy Paris, you can't get around that. Right. And mm. I, I sort of think of him a lot when I'm writing, because even though I'm telling individual stories, whether it's the murder of Pamela Werner, the escape of a Jew, I just did a small book on the escape of a Jewish girl from Shanghai to Macau or City of Devils, which is where everyone's stuck in Shanghai. Uh, you can't get away from the fact that history is moving on around your mm. characters. The Japanese are going to invade on December the 8th. Right, that's going to happen. Shanghai is going right. to be bombed on August the 14th, 1937. These things are going to happen and there's nothing you can do about it. So maintaining, finding how you can maintain the reader's interest in the individual stories when they know what's coming. Right? I'm not doing all history or anything like that. They know what's coming is a trick that I think Alan First does, does very well. Mm. Um, your mentioning Raymond Chandler reminded me of something I, I, I was thinking about in the shower quite often but forgot to put down in a list of questions and I think I don't want to don't want to extend the episode much further than we already have but this is too good not to ask you we've, we've talked about Shanghai as an art deco city modernist city cultural mix like melting pot city what about uh, Shanghai is a film noir city. Well, absolutely. I mean, my City of Devils book is called a Shanghai noir. And um, right. I'm sort of fascinated by the idea that noir, noir, of course, in Los Angeles is largely the product of German exile, Jewish German exiles, right? Mm. Um, that's why it's always raining in um, noir films, but it very rarely ever rains in Los Angeles. Right. Um, so, and, and I spent, I spent, you know, several months last year in Los Angeles just to get a plug in because until pandemic came along and everything got put on hold, we're putting together scripts and everything to do a pilot of a TV show of City of Devils. But, uh, and I should should have been there now doing it, right? But no, nothing's happened, mm. uh, but hopefully next year. And I, but so I spent a lot of time in Los Angeles driving around and sort of, you know, living in a regular Los Angeles house and driving a car up and down and the freeways and everything. And, it, and it, Los Angeles is a fascinating city with a great, fascinating history, which has been told largely in my interest by James Elroy. But it isn't a noir <laughs> city. You know, Berlin is a noir city. Weimar Berlin. And, mm. um, and Shanghai is a noir city. Why is it a noir city? Well, number one, it has all kinds of weather, which is very important for the visual of it, although there is such a thing mm. as tropical noir, I accept. But most importantly, it is a city of alienation. It is a city of, of, of balkanization. It is a city where everyone is guilty to some extent. As a foreigner in Shanghai, even as a refugee, even as a, from fascism or from Bolshevism, you, you, are, you are subject to a certain element of white privilege. You can treat the Chinese in a certain way. Right. As a Chinese person, you've chosen to live outside of China in this kind of enclave. Right. So nobody's nobody's uh, nobody's innocent. Right. Everybody is compromised by Shanghai itself, the city itself. And I talk a lot about this in hopefully interesting literary stylistic forms in City of Devils. The city itself is is this kind of place where everyone within it is corrupted to a greater or lesser extent. Nobody is innocent. And that's noir as opposed to Agatha Christie, where something awful happens like a murder. One person is found to have committed that murder, arrested for it, and the world is set right again. There is no setting right Shanghai. It's just what degree of badness um, and corruption does it, does it tolerate and who gets out alive. Right. I make a, a little... Uh kind of episode art youtube thumbnail for every one of these episodes and now i'm thinking when it comes to doing this one i should try and get some chiaroscuro lighting simulated in photoshop over the new tang i don't know if i've got the power to do that but yeah bring the bring the german expressionist to cinematography into yeah. the YouTube thumbnail but yeah um we've been on the line quite a while now and to be honest i have to go get my lunch um but thank you so much for for being on the show paul i'm, I'm sure you've given the listeners a lot to enjoy think about and you know maybe mentally transport themselves back in time to old uh, lin yu tang's old shanghai I, I really hope we've been able to do that for them great well i hope people read lin yu tang i mean there's quite a lot of other reading recommendations including me in there and mm. um 
you know, if you thought Art Deco was cool, I'm really, really sorry. <laughs> no, they, they've our listeners have now been educated. They, they now know how crass <laughs> it is. And they're going to stop drinking uh, gin liqueur as well. Good. But carry on enjoying <laughs> Shanghai. It's still fun. So thank you again to Paul French for coming on the show and making me laugh so many times. Uh, I think he quite fairly describes himself as a raconteur. I think that that's a good word for the man. Um, so now is the part of the show where I give you the plugs whilst we listen to Tong Yang play Zai Jian Jieke in the background. So if you'd like to follow me on Twitter where I tweet things mostly about Chinese uh, lit in translation or the show and sometimes other things. I am at Angus Likes Words. The show has its own Instagram account. Both on Twitter and on Instagram you'll find out things before I reveal them on the show. For example like the show topic. <laughs> it's an obvious one. Other, other stuff too. Other surprises you'll hear about first. Those are both good ways to get in touch with me too. If you'd like to uh, raise a question or catch out something on the show that me or my guests have got wrong those are good places to do that uh, another really good place to contact me or talk to other fans of the show is discord on our discord server we've also got like dedicated channels to things like uh, chinese sci-fi wuxia uh, you name it it's a good place to talk about anything and uh, of course it's only high-end intellectuals who populate that discord server so if you're listening to this show, you deserve a spot among them, that is for certain. Um, if you would like to support the show financially and keep the roof over my head, so to speak, and help pay the hosting fees, you can support the show on Patreon, I kind of already sold that to you at the start of the show. If you'd like to support the show with a one-off contribution and not have that constant monthly drain on your finances, one one or two USD sapped away per month, it's a horrifying thought. If you'd like to avoid that and just contribute once, there is a website for that too. It's buymeacoffee.com slash churchofic. The Patreon as well is uh, patreon.com slash churchofic on the end. T-R-C-H-F-I-C. But of course, money isn't really what I want from you. What I want from you is to spread the word. Tell your friends, family, or more importantly, anyone who might be interested in the show about the show. If you, if you know anyone who you think would enjoy it, please do tell them. Also, if you know a uh, local sticky-fingered banker or a sing-song girl or just a scamp or an old rogue, please tell them too, because, you know, those are also great potential listeners. So off you go and do that, and until next episode, 再见。